So green, green flashing is live. Green flashing is live. Red flashing. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, great. Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming. We're just uh, sort out mics because um, the event's also being um, streamed on um, Panopto. Um, questions do come up on Panopto, and people can type those in. So if you're watching on the live stream, um, which I hope has started. It has, yeah. It has started, yeah. You can see it all. Um, then welcome. Um, just to say welcome from me, I'm Simon Cox. I'm an uh, uh, academic and engineering, but also the university's chief information officer. And kind of what we wanted to do is to have a, a, a slightly kind of focused set of talks, short talks, around this whole theme of research workflows and high-speed data transfers. And actually, in terms of where this all came from, it came from a conversation that Tony and I had. Um, I'm not sure whether alcohol was involved, but no, it's, it's a fair bet that it might have been. Um, and it came from one of these, what if we did this sort of thing? And actually, the story through the talks um, that Tim had talked, in fact, to Tony that came to me, then it came to Richard, then it came to Simon, then it came, and it came to a whole range of different people. And actually, you begin to see that in order to deliver a piece of science working with um, STFC, working with, um, in this case, the diamond light source, all of those different moving parts have lots of different facets to them. And really, this was just a case of kind of bringing that together, sharing some of that experience, and telling a little bit of that story, but then also kind of widening it out, um, particularly as we look um, out. Um, we've got uh, David Salmon from GIS. We've got some um, uh, also um, from uh, Queen Mary as well. Um, actually then widening that out to think about what are the other kind of implications from this. So there's a little bit of kind of stuff that has happened and bringing that together, but then a little bit of opening it up. And uh, Tim, did you want to say anything more? Because you've been uh, oh, intimately thanks. involved in setting things up. And I'm extraordinarily grateful both to Tim Chan, but also um, Sigourney and Timothy from Science and Engineering South. And of course, Fran Richards for actually also making everything happen. Um, yeah, one thing I would say is, you just want to view the, the, the best results we have is when you get the researchers, the IT people, ourselves, and people supported at sort of the level of the science that working on a problem. That's when good results happen. Too often, these people don't speak to each other. Yeah. And that's See today, for example, what happens when they do. And that's essentially part of the story we're going to tell. And so, actually, with no further ado, then, I will hand over to um, Tony Hay, who's going to give perhaps position from the very broad perspective where this whole story of DMZ came from and give a little perspective and an update from the US. So uh, over to you, Tony. Um, Thank you very much. I think the slides are loaded. And okay, so that, sh that should be okay. Thank you very much. Uh, slides. Um, yes, somewhere here there must be. Right. Well, it should, it should be on here, yes. It, it's Tony Hay, the top one, yeah. That's great. Sorry. Since I used to work for Microsoft, I should be able to figure this out. <laughs> I think it's alive and kicking. It sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, good now. Okay, great. All right, so... Um, because I've just spent the last 10 years with Microsoft in the States and um, I work with NSF as well as the US Department of Energy. The US Department of Energy hosts the, the laboratories, uh, the ones like Rutherford and Darsby in this case in the UK, but actually in the US it's, it's places like Berkeley um, where they have a, a general purpose supercomputer and networking and other things. Uh, there's also Oak Ridge Laboratory, where they have a, one of the leadership scale computing facilities, and Argon Laboratory, for example. So, uh, when I came back to the. Oops. Does that actually. Work? Okay. So, this is um, uh, Eli Dart, was one of the inventors of what they call a science DMZ, demilitarized zone. Uh, I think we prefer the slightly less militaristic version data transfer zone. But the reason I became concerned when I came to Obviously. 
try that. Is that, is that better? That is better, yes. Okay, fine, all right. Um, so I, I, I became concerned because uh, I saw what they were doing in the US and we didn't seem to be doing anything similar in, in the UK or Europe. So um, the internet came out of a thing called the ARPANET, which was an experimental network linking universities and labs in the US. Uh, and the lab has a networking and they distinguish between general purpose networking and research networking for supporting large data transfers and the leading people who do that among the Department of Energy sites and they connect universities is Energy Sciences Net, ESNet. And so uh, 50 labs, 150 networks, universities, research platforms, 400 gigabits transatlantic because they now do more than just the US, uh, uh, growing number of university connections and it will support big data transfers such as you have at the LHC experiments. Routinely at Rutherford Lab they transfer from CERN a petabyte uh, you know, on, on regular basis and you need to have fast connections to do that sensibly. It's growing twice as fast as the commercial internet. Uh, okay, and it, it's, uh, so those, that's a sort of marketing slide as is this one which shows you the sort of basic links between the laboratories and, and so on and also the links that ESNet provide to, to CERN in Geneva and to Amsterdam where they developed light paths. Uh, and this is the standard um, marketing slide for the DMZ. This is what the traffic looks like with TCP IP and the DMZ it's, it's beautiful like Eurostar and so on. All right. Uh, and, and this is an old slide, even though I got it from Eli last week. Um, NSF has invested 120 million. Well, I'll give you the update on that uh, from NSF. So, but that was the idea, friction-free network path, dedicated data transfer nodes, and it also has these perf sonar uh, performance monitoring, so you can actually see in your network what performance you're getting and where are the bottlenecks. But Tim, I'm sure, will say more about that. So what they're, they're now developing ideas for what they call ESNet 6, the next generation, where they're going to go another scale up. Uh, uh, but I'd just like to talk about one of their bold um, initiatives is what they call the Petascale DTN project, which again uses the DMZ, DMZ. I'll, I may say DMZ, in which case I apologize. All right. Okay. And... and um, if I wasn't here, I'd be online to a, a meeting of OSCA, Advanced Scientific Computing Research. It's one of the departments of the Office of Science uh, in, in Department of Energy, and they're responsible for the supercomputing facilities at all of the labs, for example. And now increasingly worrying about data and machine learning from Argonne, Brooke Berkeley and Oak Ridge, as well as uh, NCSA is the... Um, leading site for NSF, for supercomputers at Illinois. And so it's really, um, you need to have end-to-end -end, end -end performance. If the computers are here and data's over here, you need to be able to move it seamlessly if you can't afford to put enough computing right where the data is. And uh, a petabyte a week it, uh, is their performance goal. Uh, and, and they want to use the Globus Online system to do... Uh, fast data transfer. So that's the only bit of Globus, it's not all the other software middleware, it's the Globus Online for, for doing fast, secure data transfers. And they've been using uh, a test set based on cosmology, which I won't talk about, uh, but they're using what they call it, the Globus Transfer Service. Okay, so um, this is where they've got to, HBC Facilities 2017, and these are the sort of numbers that you can see here, uh, gigabits per second, minimum, maximum 50 gigabits between this data transfer node at uh, Oak Ridge and, and, and Illinois, and similar numbers here, 40 odd gigabits per second. So uh, that's, that's where they are, and uh, they can do that end to end because of this uh, data transfer zone architecture. And the improvements. What they've done in various places, they've included extra data transfer nodes as, uh, at, at Argonne, at Berkeley, which is NERSC, and Oak Ridge. 
They've, all done, they've also done network upgrades, so instead of N lines at 10 gig, they've gone now to 40 gig and 100 gig to NCSA and so on. And also Globus um, has had some improvements, which gives, uh, uh, again, another improvement. So that's where they are, and, and this is the example they give um, for the benefits of that. Um, it benefits all the projects which use these big facilities for generating data and the supercomputers and so on. And uh, 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 the example they give is a redesign of a, a research data portal, which is one of the uh, uh, projects that has been supported by, for example, NSF at the universities. They have data portals, but that makes it difficult to, to mix with a, a, a DMZ, a data transfer zone. So um, this is the, the legacy portal design where you have a border router, router, per sonar, firewalls, and, and, and the portal server over here. Uh, uh, what they want to do securely is move to a system like this where you have a portal server, but the file store is in the science DMZ. You have data transfer zones, and you have a data path the router recognizes the data packet and diverts it into this system which can go at high bandwidth into the files. And so you, the portal server applications don't mix up with the data transfers. So that's, a, there's a paper by, for example, by Ian Foster and others, uh, Eli Dart, uh, written in here, and you have these slides available. Okay, so that's um, some of the plans that they're doing for ESnet 6, they're trying to upgrade everything. They have very ambitious targets beyond that. Um, what, what was missing from what we've put up in the UK is what they had a, a special, NSF had a various panels. I did the data one, I was chair of it. But there was also one on campus cyber infrastructure, CC star. And they'd been working on that for the last, I guess, five, five or six years. And Kevin Thompson is the program officer. So these are the programs in, in size, which is the Computer uh, and Information Sciences Directorate in NSF. And the cyber infrastructure is the OAC. It used to be called the, the Cyber Infrastructure Group. But it's a subset of the Computer Science Division in NSF. CC Star is Campus Cyber Infrastructure. And so they've actually recognized that you really need to have a sort of DMZ at the campus border to allow the searchers at the campus to be able to get high bandwidth transfers. Uh, and what they've also done is international network connections, which I'm not going to talk about at this moment. So let's just look at the campus cyber infrastructure and see the numbers they have there. All right. So this is 2018. Uh, they've they have a program specifically targeted at the campus infrastructure up to 500k dollars for up to two years data driven network infrastructure network design and implementation for small institutions up to three quarters of a million network integration and applied innovation a million up for two years uh, network performance engineering and outreach and I don't see a comparable thing uh, in the UK uh, uh, maybe Tim will correct me, but I don't see these numbers being anywhere near what we have in the UK. So that's the latest program with, that, that they've just announced, but it's been going on in previous years. And these are the people who've got awards, the universities, who've got some networking improvements, a DMZ-type architecture. And you can see there's a large number of networks, including the British Virgin Isles and Puerto Rico. Uh, as well, of course, uh, as Hawaii. So uh, that seemed to me that's missing in the UK and Europe that we haven't actually thought carefully about the campus cyber infrastructure to support research data movement. And that's why I was so concerned. And I'm delighted that I learned when I came back that Tim Chown had deserted Southampton to go to work for JISC and uh, is now Mr. End-to-end. -end. So this is really what it's all about. Um, 
Okay, and so these are some examples, broadening participation, so they've, they've also reached out to un, unusual places like Guam, uh, which is in reach of missiles from North Korea, uh, uh, and uh, tribal colleges and, and, and Aboriginal. So I think that's my last slide, in fact. So I think I'm in good shape. All right, so uh, I'm happy to talk about any of these, um, but I thought I would just give you their pitch on these slides, and there's, of course, a lot of information on them, um, but I really feel that you should get the impression that not only are Department of Energy investing in the, the sources of the data and the, and the leading scale supercomputers, namely the DOE labs, plus the NSF site in Illinois, NCSA, uh, but also they've been investing in, in many, many uh, universities, well over 100 universities, to give them money to really understand that the research networking issues. And I think that's what we don't have in the UK or Europe, or at least we didn't. I'm about to hear where we are, and uh, I look forward to that. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can, uh, we can take questions if there um, are any. Yeah, Dave, yeah. Sorry, I, forgot, I didn't see you there, Dave, but I shouldn't have made all these rude comments about JISC. Yeah. As you will well know, the national contexts are not equivalent. And the last time, to my recollection, that we had the kind of investment that you've highlighted there were the two Shrift programs some long time back. Which one was that? Shrift 1 and Shrift 2, where universities could bid yeah, to augment remember, yes, campus yes, yes. infrastructures. I, I'm old enough to but, remember those. But yes. there has not been an equivalent no, to that no. for, gosh, a decade or more now. I forget what the, what the, what the historical dates So you dates would agree were. it is an omission? Uh, yes, but we can, I think it's for the rest of the day to perhaps um, yeah. pull out some of the nuances around that. Yeah. But, but also I think in the, your remarks about the um, ESnet and their support teams, you know, they have a very coherent environment where they both fund, follow through and support and our yes. environment is much more diverse and yes. one of the points I'm interested in in the broad sense is how do we actually work better together to do some of those things. Yes, yeah. Just deliver to the edge of the, used to the edge of the university and then the university CIOs and things like that had to do the rest and where the funding, there were metropolitan area networks, all sorts of things at one point. Yeah, no, I've been to know where we are, uh, at, but I'm still waiting, I think, for DISC's research data strategy. I think you promised me that some, well, some months ago. There are okay, no, it's right. I, I'll, I'll leave you in peace. Uh, I, mean, I think the other kind of observation, because it's quite a mixed audience, um, uh, which was by design, actually it begins to underpin where, the way you position the US that actually that's what our researchers are competing with, whether or not it's funded, where the support is, where other things. Yeah. So in a sense, part of that pitch, which is what was really helpful for you to come along, actually to position, it's not only to a question, this is just an observation, mm. actually in terms of the IT support that we have here, our sort of our solutions teams are here, it shows what we're trying to support our researchers to do, business relationship managers working with electronics, with computer science, with engineering, and then obviously researchers to understand the context within which these things are working. And I think actually, it, for me, it kind of underlined that whilst there might be these sorts of programs, it's about driving some science, and probably the clever things that we have to do in the UK are based on how do we make this happen despite what there might be in place, despite there not being lots of cash going around, how do we actually engineer little vignettes of things happening with Diamond Light Source, with our researchers, linking into the IT services, and that's perhaps the way you carve out what we would wish to do um, to compete with that, that level of research? You know, no, no, yeah, a couple of observations, yes. So I've been uh, banging on about these things for ever since I came back. And I think what the best thing is to have some real examples of where it works and shows that you get benefits for science. And so that's why I'm particularly interested in what you're doing here with Diamond and other universities. So I think it's a great thing um, and it could lead to greater awareness of, yeah. of issues. Yeah. The, the other thing I noticed in, in, in both UCL and Manchester, that they have their IT services and now they've specifically set up research IT services where they have issues like this they're concerned with but they also have um, research support engineers 
uh, cert software engineers, and they also are looking now towards increasing that towards data scientists. So I do think there is some lessons for the university IT services to think about how they can do our next generation of big data science. Yeah, no, I think that's also a good point. It's something that, I mean, slightly more local to Southampton, as you see, people, and we've engaged with them and see that model happening. But actually, there is within, there has always been for, well, since you and I were doing mm -hmm. this stuff, oh, 20, nearly 30 Something years like ago. Something like that. <laughs> An obscene amount of time actually embedded within the IT and HPC support function. Yep. And actually, the two new hires that have come into that, Chris from um, Chemistry, one of the physicists who's come in, um, if they're in the audience, Ah, yes, so half, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see you at the back. Yeah, that's yes, yeah. And uh, uh, actually, that forms part of exactly that nugget of having some more stuff. So, in a sense, it's been a little bit in the Southampton DNA, but actually expanding that and the expectations from researchers to see that within IT it is a really good observation. And I think it's where IT can then support what research does, um, which, along with teaching, are kind of the two big lines of business for a uni. Absolutely, no, and, uh, and I remember convincing Ken Hurd, remember Ken Hurd? Some oh, of people, yes. Um, um, when I was given an SP2 by IBM, instead of we managed our previous parallel systems, but I really was very pleased that we managed to persuade them to take it on, and that, I think, led to what the great things you've got now. Yeah, yeah no, indeed. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for um, that, and I think you're around during the day. Yes, so, definitely. Uh, yeah, that's great. Well, thanks to Tony. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And so since Tim, um, late of this parish, as Tony has said, um, uh, but actually has taken those things and is now working as part of JISC in terms of leading a lot of this activity, um, and you're also partly responsible for making all of this happen, um, I'll hand over to Tim to say a little bit about um, this sort of application of these science demilitarized zones, kind of in some of the principles and practice of it. So thanks, go man. for it, Tim. So yeah, thanks, Tony. Tony's produced a, an excellent lead-in to what I'm going to talk about, which is a little bit more detail about you, how you apply the principles that Tony's been um, highlighting in the first talk in practice. So from the JISC or Janet point of view, um, the driver here is that we're seeing researchers, research organizations with an increasing interest in curating and moving around larger and larger volumes of data. So it might be data that's captured at some scientific equipment and that needs to be moved elsewhere on the network to do some compute. It might be some form of archive or storage. It might be that the data needs to go into some institutional repository, as, as Tony mentioned as well, and have good access to that. So, you know, I believe now, you know, the REF exercise, you've got to store some pretty large data sets there alongside your papers that people need to be able to access and access uh, efficiently. So there's a huge and growing demand for the ability to move data around and that the size of the data sets that we're seeing is changing as well, of course, and only going one way, which is up. Um, you know, 10 terabytes not long ago would have been considered a, a very, very large data set. Now, perhaps not so. Um, to put that in context in terms of what you need on the network, if you wanted to take 10 terabytes and move it from A to B in eight hours, you'd need a network capacity on average of about three gigabits a second to do that transfer. And we'll hear later when we talk more about the Southampton case, and Simon Lane will be talking about the network here. Um, the Southampton has 10 gigs of connectivity externally to Janet, just to set the context. So there's plenty of examples of disciplines and sciences where this is becoming more important. We won't dwell on those. Um, another interesting aspect of this are the sort of researchers' understanding and expectations about moving data around. How many people here are researchers? doing real research with large data sets. So there's a few hands sort of half going up. <laughs> not quite sure what half a hand means, but I think it's, it's not reasonable for you to understand you know, how the network works and all the intricacies of what makes things work well necessarily. Mm -hmm. However, it's good if you can articulate the requirements of what you want to do. So for example, here I've highlighted if you wanted to move 100 terabytes in a day, you need 9.26 gigs on average. So the whole Southampton link you know, forget all this other stuff that's going on, teaching and uh, <laughs> all the other traffic that goes in and out of the campus. You could dedicate pretty much the whole campus link to moving 100 terabytes in a day, if you choose to do so. I think 20,000 people might <laughs> be upset at that. The other way of looking at it, the other one I've highlighted, is one terabyte in one hour, you need just over two gigs. So if you, say, wanted to push um, eight terabytes of data in eight hours overnight, 
you'd need to consume about 2 gig of the campus, 10 gig to make that happen. So just having a feel for these size of the data sets and what's required to move them around I think is useful in the context of the campus. But from the researcher's point of view, the, one of the key questions is, well, how do I move it? Do I do this network thing? Do I copy my data? Do I try and FTP it around? And one of the things we're seeing at, at JISC is you speak to a, a number of researchers who have tried to copy the data. It's got a really lousy data rate, mumbled and grumbled, given up, gone to the coffee room and maybe grumbled some more, and then just put it all onto hard disk and carried on a hard disk. So what we'd like to do, from this point of view, is to help people help themselves by using the data to uh, moving the network, uh, sorry, using the network to move the data around. And that's why we set up this end-to-end -end performance initiative a couple of years ago. It's sort of finally now up to a full speed. We've got a, a couple of staff that are helping on that. And there's a whole bunch of activities we're doing, which basically boil down to getting the right people in a room together, the researchers, the IT people, and ourselves, to look at the problems and to work out solutions to those problems. There's a whole bunch of other best practice identification and sharing that's going on. There's some papers there that I'll hand out for you to take away and look at those types of things. Um, it's useful to be able to understand to some extent the issues that cause good or bad performance when you're doing data transfers. Um, and one thing obviously is you need at a university if you're going to move some data outside to another organization, for example, bringing it back from diamond light source to here to do some analysis. If you want to move the data back, you need a good enough connection from your institution to Janet to make that happen. So you know, if you're trying to, if you want, if your data rate that you need is 20 gigabits and you've only got 10, then you have a problem. But more importantly, putting aside the external connectivity, a lot of the issues boil down to having the right sort of network architecture and the right um, thinking within the campus deployment. And this is what Tony was alluding to with the science DMZ. The idea here is that you want to design your internal network so that the research traffic is actually treated rather differently to the day-to-day -day business traffic. And one of the main enemies here, and obviously the security people may disagree, but one of the main enemies here are the generic campus firewalls. They tend to be designed, from the vendor's point of view, to deal with tens of thousands of concurrent flows of very small amounts of data, web pages, images, emails, you name it. The type of thing that the 20,000 normal users on the campus are doing, typically. And you want to avoid them getting malware and all the other things that can go horribly wrong. That's what those expensive firewalls are bought to do. They're not designed, and in fact, the way they're designed often impairs the very high throughput, smaller number of flows that are associated with transferring research data around data sets, repository data, etc. And that's the problem. What you need to do is to design your network so that the research traffic can take a more efficient path through your network so you get that better performance. There are other things you need to do as well, tuning the end systems, the data stores, the file stores, or the data transfer nodes, or DTNs in science DMZ speak. And there's also the choice of software that you use to move the data around. Naively, people use simple tools like FTP, but there are a lot of other tools out there that are, can give considerably better performance, like Globus, which we'll hear more about later today. How am I for time, Sigourney? About halfway? Or? Yeah, just over. Cool, okay. And if you want to optimize end-to-end -end performance, you basically need to address these four things. Um, there will always be a bottleneck somewhere. Even if you optimize the, be the bottom three, and everything's really well engineered on the campus, you're using the right tools, um, and your file store is really, really well designed to, for the I.O., you may still then be hampered by the fact you've only got a 10 gig connection outside, of course. So you know, there's always going to be some bottleneck somewhere. Um, and the final point I'll just make here is that one of the big enemies in moving data around efficiently is packet loss. On the internet, files and data are moved around in little packets of information. And one of the problems I mentioned with the firewall design is if a firewall can't cope with what's going through it, generally it'll just start dropping a few packets. And the applications that are used to move the data around, they perform best when there's no packet loss. So you kind of want to engineer out that packet loss. And this is where Science DMZ comes in. There's three main components to it, as Tony said. One is the campus network architecture, which I've just mentioned. The next one is having some persistent measurement of what the network characteristics are. Typically what people do, they'll try and do something on the network and it'll either work well or maybe it won't. 
And if it doesn't work well, then they'll try pinging somewhere to see if something's working or trace routing, doing some of the sort of more common troubleshooting tools. But that only tells you what's happening at that moment of time. What you really need is something that's constantly monitoring the network so that if there are issues, you can see how your network's performing now, how it performed yesterday at the same time, and having that view over time of what's going on on the network. And thirdly, optimizing your, your storage nodes. And the bottom point I make there is that quite often you hear people talking about Science DMZ as kind of a firewall bypass. We'll put all this science traffic around the campus firewall. And in a sense, that's true. But you've still got a campus security policy. Your CIO probably regularly reviews the, um, these sort of policies and risks and what have you. And the important thing is you've got a policy, but it's, it's more about how you implement it. You don't implement, you don't th throw your science, your high volume science traffic through a firewall that's designed to do deep packet inspection and look for malware because the data that's in your science research traffic flows are not going to have malware because they're coming from your research peers. Uh, you can still apply access controls, but you do it far, far more efficiently. Oh, <laughs> everyone rotate their head 90 degrees to the right. Um, that's fine. So, I mean, Tony's kind of put that side up anyway. And the idea of Science DM. The idea of Science DNZ is that the external traffic coming into your general, you know, your users and your workstations, people doing the email and downloading videos of cats and all the things people do in a campus, comes in from the outside through the firewall, through the router that connects you to Janet, through the campus firewall, and in here. The idea of Science DNZ is to put a switch router at the edge, if you like, the on ramp to the Janet network such that the traffic going in and out to your DTNs is not going through the campus firewall. Therefore, it doesn't tend to suffer those packet losses, and therefore, it performs better. Oh, and that one is the right way around. And you can extend this. You can have sort of multiple areas where you do this. And as Tony says, one of those areas, well, one of the areas might be a high-performance computing cluster with a data store. Another might be your institutional repository, for example. There's different things you can put into these areas if you want to improve the access to them. Um, there are, the good news is there's quite a few examples of Science DMZ principles in practice in the UK. So one of the main ones of those is the particle physics community, the grid PP, just like the UK wing of the uh, CERN Large Hadron Collider experiment community. And there's about 20 of those sites. And most of those now have kind of applied the Science DMZ principles. But if you spoke to them, they don't always know what Science DMZ is. They've just done these principles because they are common sense. ESNet wrote them down and said, here's a design pattern that you should follow that is common sense. But at least then you've got something you can refer to. There's a paper on Science DMZ, you've got something to refer to. It's basically common sense about network engineering, engineering out packet loss. So we see examples of that at those grid PP sites. There's Diamond Light Source have done it. We'll hear more about that. Um, Jasmine and Cedar at STFC have done it. They call the Science DMZ, a data transfer zone. And I think that's a much nicer name for it. The D DMZ implies there's <laughs> something else, something military, something different. So, and at GISC, we kind of like the idea of referring to the research data transfer zone, data transfer zone. But when you say Science DMZ, the big advantage is people know what you're talking about because it's a term that's been used now for four or five years. So. But we're, we, we say RTDZ now. So there's good examples of that happening. So just to wrap up, um, just go through the, the context of what's happening at Southampton, the case study we've been doing with iSolutions and the researchers here, um, just to sort of ground these science DMZ principles. So you're going to hear more about this from Rich later. But the, the task at hand here was to where these researchers go to Diamond periodically and generate a few you know, 10, 20 terabytes of data make improvements to the campus network architecture so that data can be brought back over the network rather than on a data dispenser and hard disk. That's what it boils down to. Um, you know, the data rates when Rich first tried to do this were relatively low. And as we'll hear later today, we went through various steps to, to improve that. Um, and there are basically three areas where those improvements were made. One is, as we mentioned before, the network engineering. And the interesting thing here was that we compared two approaches. One was the classic science DMZ, where the um, oh, little red dot does work here, where there is an external DTN. So you're coming straight off Janet, 
off the edge router for Southampton into the DTN, and the other is to put is to use the storage node in building five where the researcher's storage is, and to see how that compares. And actually, as it turned out in Southampton, it doesn't compare that badly because Simon has signed off a big check for a nice performant firewall here, Palo Alto firewall. So there is a relatively good throughput, relatively good compared to many other universities. So we were able to drive it at eight or nine gigabits a second. The trouble is when there's, and that's, that's at the, the small hours of the evening, during the working day when there are tens of thousands of flows going through it and it's trying to deep packet inspection, all this stuff, that's where it becomes less performant. I've got a little chart that'll show you that in a moment. So it's that network engineering and we decided to compare those two here. Second thing was changing the transfer tools that you use rather than using FTP or RSync we started some experiments with Globus, so Richard's going to talk more about that and his thoughts on that. Um, it's generally a, a simple tool to use. You have your data that's at Diamond, you have your own file store as two data endpoints, and you pretty much almost drag and drop the data that you want to bring back using that interface. And it's fire and forget. You drag it over, it'll start happening, and you can go away and do what, whatever you like. And this uses something, a transfer tool called Grid FTP under the hood that does multiple parallel TCP transfers. So if there is a bit of packet loss, then um, it works around it because you've got multiple streams at the same time. And then the third aspect, again, Tony mentioned it, is deploying this persistent monitoring, the perf sonar nodes. And this is something we've been doing a lot at JISC um, with a lot of sites encouraging them to deploy these measurement systems because then you get much better eyes on the situation in terms of what happens if you really want to move data in and out of a campus. So it does three or four things. The most important things are it measures, well, so I'll wind back a bit. A persona device is essentially a physical device. You put some open source software on it, a package called persona, and it lets you then measure loss, latency, and throughput between any of those devices that are deployed anywhere. So in the Southampton case, we had a persona node at Diamond for our case study our own reference one on the Janet network in London, one outside the Southampton firewall where the external DTN was, and one inside the firewall where the Building 5 data store was. So we could then measure the effective throughput and the network characteristics between all those points, which is really, really useful to us. The loss and latency is measured continuously, and the throughput test runs every few hours. And essentially, for a, a short period of time, it's simulating a data transfer to see what rate you would get, what available capacity there is in the network. So you can set up little meshes here and see the status of all the different types of transfers that are happening between the different endpoints. That's a nice visual way of, of looking at it. But you can also dive in and see more specific details over time. So this is showing you from our Janet London persona node to the internal Building 5 data store, Rich's file store, um, in their center inside the firewall. And you can see what's happening here. This is a one-month period. So it's, doesn't take much to guess that actually all these peaks here are the evenings when it's really quiet and there's no one on campus. Um, and then the troughs are the busy parts of the day where you're dropping down below four gig throughput because the firewall is becoming overloaded. It's having to deal with all the other traffic that's happening on the campus. So you can imagine if you do some overnight transfers, you might, might do okay. But in general, there's a high variability and some quite low troughs. If you look at the same before and also you know, quite a lot of, pack, or relatively a lot of packet loss happening here, which again is, is the enemy. And then if you look at the same thing, but for the external perf sonar node, then you see it's far, far more consistent, far less variability. So that's a really good indicator that if you're transferring to and from the external node, you're going to get that better performance, and there's only a couple of very small... Oh, one one way um, something measurement protocol. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just the name of the tool that's being used to do the, the measurement. Um, so that's kind of all I've got, got to say. I think working with Southampton and Diamond has been great. There's a couple of case studies we've got there that I'll pass out in a, in a break or put on your desks. Um, so we've looked at it from the Diamond point of view and the Southampton point of view. And the interesting thing that's happening is comparing the classic science DMZ with the external DTM with trying to optimize the internal network, putting 10 gig through to the internal data store and just seeing how well that will do in comparison. 
And actually, as I said, because the firewall that Samsung have deployed is an expensive and performant one, the comparison isn't so bad as, as you see elsewhere. The problem is, though, if you want to upscale what we're doing here, that's when the external DTM becomes a far, far more attractive thing. Because as more researchers want to move data around, as more people want to access the institutional repository, if you put that in the Science DMZ, you don't have to scale up that expensive firewall to handle all that traffic. That's in your Science DMZ. The, the, the expensive firewall can then focus on the day-to-day -day business stuff and protecting from malware and cat videos or whatever, <laughs> whatever happens, whatever the, the important day-to-day -day business things, things are here. Um, so Simon will talk more about the, sort of those upscaling issues. Um, and I think the headline we'll hear from Rich and, else, and maybe Simon as well, there's an order of magnitude improvement in that throughput from where we started with the first test that Rich did with R-Sync um, through to where we were at the end. So we went from about 400 megabits a second up to 4 gig a second as a common throughput we got. So that was the upscaling that we achieved there against a 10 gig campus connection, of course. Um, and then finally, yeah, I'll just emphasize, we do refer to this as the research data transfer zone rather than um, science DMZ. And the big win is, once you put that research data transfer zone in place, any other scientists or researchers at the site can benefit from it. So we've done this pilot here in this experiment with the DTN outside so that Rich's research group can benefit. But now that will also benefit him if he chooses to um, do other types of transfers, and anyone else that wants to bring, bring data back to Southampton can benefit from that as well. And that's it. There's a, a load of links there. The slides will be available somewhere so you can look at those later. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tim. That's great. Um, we've got time for questions or observations. Just an observation. This was exactly the sort of experiment that I was keen to see done, so congratulations to both right. of you. Stunned silence. Well, I was, I was just, just going to put on the record that when you, when you said e expensive firewall, I, I think what I heard you say is extraordinarily cost-effectively, prudently purchased firewall <laughs> that, that um, leverages that's, that's the said, benefits it? of, in a research-intensive university, of having something that's serves our educational purpose, but serves our research purpose. But, I mean, flippancy aside, actually, that pragmatic choice around what's the security that protects our network from the threats that you see in the daily newspaper, if you open yes. them today, against making sure that when you're making those choices as to what hardware to buy, actually, you'll probably buy something a bit different if you just thought of the education side, something a bit different if you just thought of the research side. But actually, if you spend just a tiny bit more, you kind of get the best of both worlds. And I think that is a message about configuring campus networks. Yes. And again, that then is part that folds into the conversation we have with JISC about, there's one thing about delivering service to the edge of the campus, but then actually saying, but if you make these sorts of choices for your sorts of institutions, that kind of specialist knowledge that JISC has, if you just did this extra little bit, you'll get all of these other benefits too. And that's where yeah. that kind of partnership, certainly we at Southampton Value with JISC, um, really begins to come into its own. That's where I think there's that specialist role of a provider that really understands the business of the education and of the research that we do. So, yeah, Very I mean, well put. you, you, you catal <laughs> Tony catalyzed, I did something other, but actually the work that JISC did um, in making it happen and the SES group sort of bring it together is what we're going to go on to hear about now. Oh, Ivan, yeah. So it won't take too long to explain what the security model is for the DMZ that uh, enables you to bypass the campus firewall. I th well, I think Simon might be mentioning that a little bit in his talk. Um, so essentially what it boils down to is you have a policy and it is how you implement it. So um, in terms of the data stores and the transfer endpoints, those systems themselves will run host-based filtering. And then essentially what the firewalls are coming down to is, well, sorry, the access control lists that you're applying are coming down to uh, um, simple stateless implementations of filters without the deep need for deep packet inspection for the flows that are coming in and out of those data storage nodes. Um, 
Well, that's what they do at, of course, the particle physicists do at Rutherford Lab. Oh. They have, they, of course, they called it a firewall bypass, which didn't seem to me such a great idea. So I prefer research data transfer zone. But then, of course, you need to go and get access to that data in the research enclave outside in a secure way from inside. And that's where they use these certificates. So for, sorry, Tony. So for Globus, there are... Uh, the endpoints, you can use certificates as the means of securing access to those. So Rich will have been through that. And, um, he's still alive, so it's... <laughs> so just an observation on that, that um, I heard a couple of days ago that um, some, of the, some of the recent initiatives have been funded. Dirac's got some more money, but the UK Tier Zero has got some more money, I believe. Now, I was party to one of the early discussions at Cusner's recently, and in response to that question about certificates, not for me to answer, but there is now an emerging context within decisions about AI will be made about the infrastructure that supports SDFC's work, and which indeed could be a model by adopting uh, or broadening the kind of principles we're discussing here. So, and I know Andrew Sansom, who's leading that, is very keen, keen and very pragmatic about this. They want stuff that works now, not, not R&D. So I think that's one to watch. I think it will also depend on the type and nature of the data. So pulling back data from Diamond, it's understandable you need a certificate to be able to identify who you are to pull your research data back. But if it was, say, an institutional repository with some very large data sets, then that presumably should be published openly anywhere, I assume. So you, I wouldn't imagine you'd need a certificate to access any um, data that was in the repository. For example... Yeah, what, one comment to make on certificates is that it allows third-party transfers. That, that's me sitting in my, in my office to ask Rutherford to transfer data to Brookhaven, for example. That's one of the... So you're then, your office doesn't need a, a fast internet, internet connection. The sites where the data is going, moving to and from do. This, this uses X509 certificates. Uh, and I, I, it was, I, I now look at that as one of the, the drawbacks of the e-science program. The, they were only ever manageable by particle physicists, as far as I could see. Mm. If you go outside of the HPC community, people were really put off by the process of having the difficulty around obtaining an e-science certificate. So, yeah. Well, so I mean, can I just put some? Um, so in Diamond, we're using Globus, but one of the reasons we're using it is because you don't have to use certificates with the Globus Online stuff. And so our users just simply access it with their federal ID, their, their username and password that we give them when they register for Diamond. And so, you know, we're very pragmatic in what tools we expose to users because we want it to be simple and easy to use. And, you know, we're not in the HEP world. And, and so, you know, we're, we're not using certificates. So just to say, your users typically don't have a DMC at their That's right. Thank you very much. Great. And um, now we're going to move on to, there's a slight break between them. Um, the, 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 the two people who, um, when, I, when I bounced in, gave me the slightly quizzical look as to um, just what exactly are we getting into. Um, the slightly <laughs> quizzical look from, from Richard was, was perhaps less... Well, I'll reflect on Simon's look when I introduce him. <laughs> um, but Richard is kind of on that sort of research end of things. Um, because I had some involvement with the work that MUVIS does, which I'm sure um, Richard's going to say a little bit about. Actually, there, we, we had these long discussions about stuff going in jiffy bags and on hard disk drives. And just the assumption that, well, there'd be no reason to do anything other than that. And kind of the story that... Um, Rich is going to tell, and then I think we'll also do some little demo of some live bits with if the demo gods are with us, um, is what we're going to um, hand over to you now. So, Richard. All right, thank you very much, Simon. So, um, my name is Richard Borden. I work down in the X ray uh, imaging centre here at Southampton called Muvis, um, where we have uh, a number of uh, X ray CT systems. These uh, let us do non-destructive evaluation of everything from biological things to engineering components, aerospace, that sort of thing. We work with commercial customers and internal researchers across all the faculties here. Um, we can achieve 
uh, spatial resolutions down below the micron level, um, and we can handle samples up to sort of the meter scale and look inside those things. Um, our X-ray energies go up to the best part of half a megavolt. Um, <clears throat> but we also have a quite significant compute resource down there, which we use day to day. We have a lot of PhD students who come down there. So we have around a dozen high-performance workstations, so to half a terabyte of RAM, lots of CPU cores, lots of storage. And we have a mix of open source and commercial software for sort of paring down these data sets and analyzing them. <clears throat> but what we're interested in today is looking at the data sets that we generate and moving those around. So internally, in MUVIS, uh, a typical CT scan will make 20 terabytes of the X-ray projection data. And then when we reconstruct that, we'll get a single 30 terabyte volume, typically. Some are much larger, some are fair, fairly small, but that's sort of the, the, the median size. We'll get some metadata with that as well, uh, derivative data sets that are, that are typically a lot smaller. But our data generation rate works out as being up to 10 gigabytes per, per minute per machine, and we can run those machines continuously. So we have a fairly continuous, relatively high data throughput. So <clears throat> when we need to do even higher throughput work, then we need to go to somewhere like the Diamond Light Source. So they have a, 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 a very brilliant photon beam there. So we can go and do hundreds of samples per visit. So rather than our typical sort of five minutes plus acquisition times, and we may spend hours capturing a single data set in some cases, at the Diamond Light Source, uh, we can capture those very, very quickly, and we'll generate much more, much more data. So uh, we may do 100 samples a visit, and what we'll do is we'll send a team of people, maybe two, three, four researchers, possibly with, uh, with an experienced hand, to go along there and run work on the beam line for 24 hours a day. Um, so we'll generate maybe between 10 and 50 terabytes of visit. If anyone's doing a technical phase retrieval, this greatly inflates the size. So we may be looking at an order of magnitude more than that. So we'll, get, we'll go to these, uh, these sites perhaps half a dozen times a year, and Diamond is one of those sites. Um, <clears throat> so what we do currently, though, is um, we will copy those data sets that we generate onto hard disks, take them home, and then copy them to our local data stores. And uh, at that point, the researchers can start doing their analysis. So typically a few days afterwards, because it takes a little bit of time to ingest those data stores at the other side. Um, but rather than just having those data, store, those data sets when we get back, uh, sometimes the data that they capture can be useless because if the reconstructed data, we just got valid projection data, but they made a mistake with the reconstructions, and perhaps inexperience means that they wouldn't know that they are, they are particularly bad, then we'd have to redo it. So we have to, in some cases, take the data back up to somewhere like Diamond, re-reconstruct the data, and come back. So we have to repeat the whole thing again. If we had issues on the beamline itself, so uh, if we had noisier images for some reason, or uh, the this, this scintillator chip, so the bit that's going to turn the high-energy photons into visible light, if this has issues, then these might not, again, be picked up on the beamline at 4 a.m. with a harrowed first-year PhD student, might not know what they're looking at. But people back on campus may well. And we can't afford to send, start sending experienced researchers there all the time with the sort of amount of other things that are going on. Um, and we have had one trip where every data set captured has been invalid for one reason or another. So it's, it, it's not worked out particularly well. Um, so everything was out of focus, the setup wasn't right, and so the data would just, it just weren't as good as we'd like. So here would be an example problem. So that's, uh, that's, that's a single radiograph. I actually captured that here. So that's, uh, that's the interface of a hard disk head. That's at 381 nanometers. Um, I don't know if anyone can see what the problem might be there. But on the next slide there, so we had some crazing on the scintillator. So is this a problem or not? Um, that's going to depend on how badly it's damaged and how badly the correcting that is going to affect the dynamic range of the image. But an experienced uh, operator might be able to look at that and say, we didn't need a scintillator chip there. And sometimes beamline scientists are reluctant to go and put a new one of those in because they cost a bit of money. So uh, another problem here. So it's the same image, a slightly different scintillator. And the problem here is that at the top, 
we have a little crack on the, uh, on, on the scintillator, or apparently a crack. Um, again, uh, <clears throat> same sort of problem, well, that can destroy a data set because that will put an artifact in that top corner all the way around. So, what are our priorities? We want to get all the data back correctly, reliably, quickly, and ideally during the acquisition. So those experienced users can look at the data that's coming back and say, okay, we've got a problem with that, you need to insist that we change this, or we need to set up the focus again, we need to do something. So currently we can't really do that, or we don't really do that. So our gold standard, if you like, is rsync with hard disks. It's slow, but it's correct and reliable. So it transfers one file at a time, checks sums each file, put it on a hard disk at Diamond, and this can run continuously at the end of the session, finish up those transfers, carry the whole bag of hard disk back, and then we repeat the same process putting it onto our own data stores. So, <clears throat> um, we have some internal tracking, so we'll generate those data sets with, with numbers on there, and we'll try and uh, separate them up as automatically as we can, but there's only so much that we can do. Um, and the, the problems with these things uh, is if, the main one is if one of those data sets are corrupted, we can't transfer it back off the hard drive, the hard drive is lost, we have to do it again. So this happens not frequently, but often enough that it's something we have to be cognizant of. We have to remind ourselves that one of those hard drives that's getting dragged around, possibly back from uh, on an aeroplane, getting handled by a baggage handler, uh, it's not necessarily going to make it back. Um, <clears throat> if we lose a disk physically, uh, then um, a third party could access and, and read that data. That wouldn't, be a, that wouldn't be a good thing either. I mean, of course, there are issues with, with encryption, but we're talking about inexperienced users trying to transfer data at 4 a.m. But um, <clears throat> on the whole, it's correct, and over time, it's reliable. So it takes a little while to do it. So <clears throat> uh, if we were to use sort of a regular Explorer-type copy, then uh, we don't necessarily get those checksums or anything like that. So this is why we use rsync. I don't know if anyone is familiar with it. I expect some people are. Um, but it is a bit slower because it has to do these things and it will do these files one at a time. There's no clever parallel file copying really going on. Um, uh, but we will also drive these tools via scripts to do any sort of renaming that needs doing with the data sets and to work out who owns what and put it in the right place. And that's usually what it looks like. So there we go, that's rsync. We've got a single line at the top there, um, which has some progress. So that's putting in a group of data sets there from a disk. And there we go, it will just progress through at the bottom. With some of those sort of typical and very variable data rates that Tim was mentioning before, you have a file going at 21 megabytes a second, 42, 81 megabytes. So it's, so it's quite variable. And these are, these are fast disks, fast machines, but these are still bottlenecks. So can we transfer things over the network? The common perception is that the internet is too slow to do this. Um, and what we do at the moment is uh, occasional data sets will be copied over ones that didn't quite make the, make the cut or they were still reconstructing when we had to catch that flight home. Um, so those ones will get copied back across the network. Uh, people tend to use their campus connected, possibly congested personal workstations for this. So they're trying to fight all the rest of the traffic in the middle of the day to get this over. So that best case scenario is that one gigabit per second that the typical desktop has. So, enter Globus. Promises the efficient, reliable transfer of files between two endpoints. Diamond Light Source already has an endpoint, so we set one up at Mubis to test this out. Um, but Mubis has a standard campus one gig connection. So our best case is going to be around two thirds of that hard disk speed. So the answer was kindly provided to us. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> uh, with a 10 gigabit connection going into the back of my workstation to Janet. So we set this up, and um, then we set up a very high-speed data store to make sure we didn't have any bottlenecks on our side. Um, so something where we can demonstrably get in excess of two gigabytes per second writing continuously. And then we brought in some data sets from Diamond Light Source and CERN. And we got the real data set from Diamond Light Source 2. So um, the user experience, the live demo part. So let's have a look at this then. That's so I have a browser on here, I hope so. Okay, so let's see what it looks like then now we've got it all set up. So uh, I go to globus.org. Yes. And then I log in. 
and I have a Globus ID here, and so if I log in now, hopefully, fingers crossed, I should get a much nicer interface window. So here we go. Uh, it shouldn't be too unfamiliar to a lot of researchers. So I choose my endpoints. Um, so today I'm going to choose Diamond Light Source up here. And I've already logged in earlier on, so it shows me the things that I have, uh, I have access to here. So if I go into this Globus test directory, um, I have access to a number of files here. And if I go to over here and select my endpoint over at MUVIS, <coughs> and uh, let's put something in here. So if I want to now transfer uh, this 50 gigabyte file, I can just select this, or I can do a larger series of files. Uh, let's do a couple. And um, live demo transfer test, let's try that. And I can choose some options here, so I can uh, only transfer the new files, so rsync-like behavior. I can encrypt the transfer too if I want. Um, delete, all that sort of usual stuff you might expect. And then I just hit this button and away it goes. Magic. So at this point I can close my browser and now get on the train and go back home. And knowing that my data are now being transferred back to campus. And so I can actually pull this up and, and check. So it takes a little while to get going there, but it shows me I've got two pending data, data sets selected to go across. And uh, it gives you some more information. Any events that occur along the way, it'll, it'll, it'll show up here. So, <coughs> that is more or less it for the transfer. So, um, we've been through this a little bit, but what is going on on that endpoint? Um, so, um, what we have here is I can see that it's, this is the download. This is also my local workstation. And it's a nice graphical thingy to show me what's going on. But I have a transfer right here. The blue line is the, is the incoming. So that's in excess of 800 megabytes a second coming through, that link. And then we've got the, the write-out to the file store there. So it sort of is a little bit bursty, but that is, is writing out. So the, the line is more or less following 400 megabytes a second there. So this is significantly quicker. And then uh, thanks to uh, <coughs> Alex at Diamond and Simon here at Southampton, uh, I managed to get some results to match these, uh, so these, the information from uh, about the 10 gig link at, at, at each side. And so we can see, so this is when I was doing my, uh, I was doing a, a transfer every half an hour or so, a large one, um, and then going to sleep for half an hour, and I was doing this overnight to not sort of step on anyone's toes. Um, but sure enough, there it is, we're getting these, these good, nice, high data rates. So um, after the transfer, though, we can, we can check out some of these files that have come back, and we have our own means back here of verifying our experimental data beyond the sort of checksumming. Um, and so we can cross-reference that, and it all generally comes in all right. And the nice thing about this is, as it, because it's coming in live, this data, we can start checking it as it's coming in. So people can just continuously run this through synchronization, just hit a button every now and again, and then someone at the other side, who is nice and fresh and working broadly 9 till 5, can check these data and, uh, and, and say, ah, you've got a problem, or everything's looking good, all that good stuff. So, what are the pros and the cons? Now, <clears throat> relatively simple to do a fairly complex task, and that persistent connection by the user is not required. I can start off the transfer on my phone, and uh, sure enough, I can, I can just disconnect it when I get on the train, and my transfer's carrying on. And those small files, because of this concurrency that it has, uh, tend to transfer much more quickly sort of as, uh, as, as, as a block. Now, I did come across a couple of, uh, of issues with it, and this may be my own inexperience with, with Globus as a tool, but I found that it wasn't 100% reliable uh, for one reason. When I had a permission error on one file, this was someone else's data set, um, it would just sort of go into a loop and keep retrying, copying that file over and over and over again rather than sort of saying, I can't copy that one, let's do the rest, and report that back at the end. And I wasn't getting any sort of feedback about this through my email to say, I'm having trouble with this file right now. It was only at the end, once it had timed out, it said, that didn't work. The other issue I found is it doesn't check available disk space before it starts the transfer. It doesn't ask the endpoint if it's got enough space to go. And my real world data sets, I said to the student, I said, how big is it? And he said, oh, it's 20 terabytes. I said, brilliant, I have 25 terabytes free, copy. 
And then I checked it, and it said it's failed. So I repeated it, and it went again, it failed again. He neglected to tell me about the other 50 terabytes he had in there. So, <laughs> um, so I had somewhat of a problem uh, completing that transfer successfully. So uh, I think it is really, really close to being a very, very powerful tool for this sort of thing. If we could just tweak those things, or if there's some setting or some sort of idiot's guide for someone like me to actually figure out how to configure it in a way that would let it do this, that would be great. And if we can do that, then we can get past the final one in that it's yet another system that people have to figure out. <coughs> okay. So um, <clears throat> the question then, just to quickly wrap up, is what do I do? Well, with Globus in its current state, I can't 100% recommend that because what we have at the moment is reliable and doesn't have those permission errors. And uh, if it does, it just skips on and we can figure that out. But with Globus, we can't entirely set and forget it just yet. Um, so um, it's, it's a little bit tricky to choose. So right now, I would still have to air day-to-day -day on reliability over performance and still go for that bag of disks, but I think we're really, really close to Globus. Okay, thank you very much. Questions, and we've also got a little sort of kind of comfort break, not, uh, so we've got a, a, a little bit of time now also for people to chat to each other, but yeah, we'll take some questions as well. Um. Very interesting to see the speeds you're managing to get with Globus, though um, also worth noting we we put in a slightly less fancy firewall than the universities, but only slightly. Um, and with SSH and rsync, we've managed to have people almost hit gigabit um, transfers. So it is possible. It's obviously harder than with Globus because mm. you're using TCP, you've got um, the issues that uh, inherent with that and whereas Globus I believe is UDP so is it is it not it is TCP as well I, th I think it does have an option for UDP but I very deliberately <laughs> turned that off okay that's you <laughs> you learn something new every day um, but it, it, you you can do it and I, I I don't know what everybody else's experiences with this is but every time we've tried to sort of um, get users to think about using something else the We've never even bothered setting Globus up for them because the answer has just always come back as, oh, no, 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 if it's not, if it's not as one step as rsync over SSH, we're not interested. And they'd actually rather, they'd rather put up with lower speeds than learn anything new. Mm -hmm. um, that's, so. that's absolutely not unreasonable, and that is, that is what people want to do. Um, I think the nice thing about the web interface is that it's not particularly scary and hopefully if all the endpoints were in place it's not really another thing for people to do you just say okay we've got this credential uh, you guys you guys have your own little, little login login set the transfer up and we'll figure it out later yeah i think this is in my deck it's sort of on the last slide i didn't really mention it is it's kind of the, the comfy slipper thing so once you get used to working in a certain way with certain tools there is any change can be a bit of a step change um, I think the Globus interface itself is pretty nice, but Richard has a, 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 f a fair point that you, know, you, you have expectations in the way a certain tool works. So rsync works by, if there's some file it can't read for some reason, it'll just skip past it, finish, and then at the end say, oh, I couldn't read these two files. Globus, by default, will just sit there and wait till someone fixes it for it, and then continue when, when, when you do. Now, I think in this case, this was... A, rare, a relatively rare event that was caused mm -hmm. by some other issue on the diamond system that's since been fixed. But it highlights that the, you, as a researcher, you may have to think differently if you're using different tools. And then there are, of course, also other tools out there. So there's a range of tools that you can use, and different communities tend to latch onto different tools. The biomedicine, biomedicine people seem to have latched onto something called Aspero, which Tony has probably heard of. That is a UDP-based tool. So there's a range of tools out there. I think from the high-level point of view, the interesting thing here is the improvements to the, you know, it's the network engineering that Simon has done. That's what's facilitated the high-speed transfers. Then it's a matter kind of independently of finding the right software tool for the job that the researchers are happy to use. Well, I will come to David. But that, that was actually my take home um, from this, which was... This is a nice problem to have in the sense that, you know, this is not about persuading university IT and CIOs to write another big check for a piece of firewall hardware networking. It's not about digging up the road. You know, 
if the only problem you've got is the software and some improvements that could be made to it, that's a really nice problem to have because software can be written and deployed certainly a lot faster than digging up roads and revamping universities' IT infrastructure. D D David. Right, so that, that's an interesting discussion and I think reflects perhaps that those are the sets of tools which operate at the current scale which still enable the research people to do the job they need to do. But it won't work strategically as the, as, the, as the science and the research requirements need more to be done. Those tools will fail. And there is a case where we can work with, um, let's say, champions within the research disciplines who are also interested in how these tool sets, if we can crack that one and start to put in some strategic strands so that on behalf of their colleagues, those tools are beginning to be made ready for when the broader community needs to mature to that greater scale. Uh, then we, we need to be looking at that, finding people that we can work with that are willing to do it and have the knowledge to help bridge the networking world into that research discipline. Yeah, sure. yeah that's a good point. Yeah, sure. I'm just going to say, come, come and talk to the Research Software Engineer, Engineer Network in September in Birmingham and tell us and that you'll get your inroads there. Okay, well... Um, we, we built in a little bit of time. Yeah, we should thank uh, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Oh, also, I see it looks like it's done 50 gig in that time. Yeah, yeah. Yep. What my son better. would say if this was our home broadband, but let's not go there. <laughs> um, we built in a little bit of time um, just to kind of stretch legs, but also for people to have sort of comments and no pun intended networking time. So um, we, that's been done so many times at these sorts of meetings, that joke, um, networking time. Um, so if we can be back in here um, for about 10 to 3 to hear from Simon Lane, who is the Simon who's actually done all the hard work, not, not this Simon, um, that would be great. But it just gives us time just to mill around and, and have a chat with each other. So yeah, 10, 10, 10 to 3 is when we'll start again. Oh, Tim left these at the front. Of yeah, the I'll picture. hand them out. A bunch of papers and other stuff, so perhaps now is also a good time to grab some of that uh, collateral. There's some really good stuff in this. Uh, Thank you. 
Thank you. 
That makes it live. So I don't know if you want to feed it up, but that's, you just turn it from. Yeah. 
then I turned it off. Does that, does that work for you? Hello? Yeah, I think that's Anyone there? Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. No refreshments. Hello. Could you all sit down, please? <laughs> I think Simon's <laughs> going to get going. <laughs> Thank you. Is the live stream on? Okay, so um, yeah, we're just uh, we're still pretty much keeping to time, um, which which is a good thing. So, having started with that kind of big picture from um, Tony as to the provocation about the U.S., and then from Tim um, talking about the kind of U.K. scene, and then we've gone into that kind of case study side of things, and it was sort of game of two halves. And um, Richard um, Boardman talking about the activities that drove this from the sort of scientific side was one part of the story. Um, and I, I mentioned Richard's quizzical look when we said, well, what about this slightly off the wall idea? Are you up for it? And um, Richard's known me for a, a, little, a little longer um, and, and was kind of game for doing something. Um, Simon's been kind of awesome and stellar because I, I toddled along to your desk and said, as a, a vague unknown wandering into the IT domain, um, how about this crazy thing? And I, I feel sure uh, I can only imagine what you said after I'd walked away from the desk. Um, uh, but Simon was up for doing something innovative and interesting, for which I'm eternally um, grateful. And actually now Simon's going to say a little bit about um, what we did at the network level um, at Southampton to make some of this stuff work. So over to you, Simon. Okay. Well, I was trying to work out exactly why it might be that I had a bit of a quizzical look on my face since you mentioned it half an hour ago. Um, and I think maybe because you used the word terror, as in terabytes, and... Um, typical networking people like me don't really work in terror things. Um, and we particularly don't work in bytes, we work in bits. Um, so I was probably trying to work out how big this thing was that you were talking about, and it sounded exceedingly big. Um, and, and in general, you know, we're, we're up to gigabits. I mean, you said bytes then. We're up to gigabits now, um, but, but terror is, is a bit scary. And I know you guys talk about petters and things as well, so I haven't a clue what one of those is. Um, so anyway, as far as I was concerned, this was pretty much the, the, the brief that I managed to boil it down to, I think, um, which was that we were going to work with NuViz, we were going to work with Richard, uh, we were going to get them to perform some tests, see what they could get with their existing one gig connection. Um, we were going to deploy this thing called Perf Sonar um, in two different places because we wanted to try and measure how the network was performing, um, and maybe that would predict um, what it is we might be able to achieve if indeed we managed to give um, Richard a 10 gig connection directly to his data store. Um, so those were the main points and, and, and the last one really was well perhaps we can replicate what it was that uh, Richard was doing with Globus and his data store outside of the, uh, the campus border firewalls and of course after, after Simon went away I had to do a lot of googling to understand what on earth he was talking about. <laughs> um, what Perf Sonar was, what Mike Muvis was, um, and, and, and what DTNs might look like. So um, we did a bit of that. Um, what I thought I'd just do is quickly sort of summarise uh, what we've got, the, if you like, the facilities that we've got in the network or available at the university um, to actually provision some sort of networking. So um, in terms of the actual active equipment, um, our network is, is basically, it's kind of fundamentally based on the Highfield campus. Um, even our data center sort of hangs off the Highfield campus on the whole. Um, and we've got a core network, switches, we've got two on the Highfield campus, um, which are the, the key ones, and each of those has 140 10 gigabit interfaces, that's the thing on, on, the, uh, on the left. This is, oh, I like that. Um, lots of fiber optic cables coming out of there, and all of those cables are all going off to the different um, edge distribution switches in, in the various buildings around the Highfield campus predominantly. Obviously, some of those fibers go off to do our Janet connection and other campuses and things like that. So the, the second slide there, um, and I suppose the thing you might say about the core switches there is, is they're probably pretty close to non-blocking switches internally. 
again, what exactly does that mean? You're never quite sure, but um, in theory, they probably got the capacity. Um, in the edge buildings, uh, this is a particularly nice um, looking rack in the middle. Um, we've got stacks of Ethernet switches that deliver one gig connections to the users. Um, you get 48 one gig ports on a switch and you've stacked the switches up to eight, possibly nine high. Uh, there's probably seven or something, two stacks there. Um, this one's not in building five because the building five rack is a very old one. It's very small, it's very narrow. Uh, it's in a sort of public area, it's not ideal. Um, but it's there, it's got the same switches in. And those stacks of switches, each stack is served with two 10 gig uplink connections. Um, the other type of networking we've got, of course, is, is wireless. Um, and we've got about 2,800 wireless access points around the university. That does include halls of residence. Um, just to say the technologies you've got there, at the moment, 802.11ac is probably going to deliver you about 1.3 gigabits per second on a very, very good day with lots of users, and that's the sort of aggregate throughput you, <laughs> you maybe would get, theoretically. Um, but clearly wireless is not in the picture for this, this game, go the right way. Um, the other things we've got, part of the infrastructure, on the left-hand side we've got ducts, obviously, where the cables run. And I kind of like that picture. I kind of like the way the, the red of the bricks contrasts with the blue of the draw ropes. But it's like a Picasso painting. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's quite a good one. Um, but we have got quite an extensive um, duct infrastructure now on Highfield Campus. We've, we've kind of um, dug a hole over new ducts recently to try and effectively avoid the footprints of buildings. Um, Hopefully in future that enables buildings to, to, to go up and come down. The ducts will run between, so you've not got one building dependent on another building, you haven't got things daisy chained. So we have improved the duct capacity in the building. If we wanted to, at the end of the day, we could pull more cables through to most of, well, all of Highfield Campus relatively easily. Um, into those ducts we've installed a whole lot of new fibre optic cables, um, 30 kilometres of cables, 750 kilometres of single mode fibre, that's just individual strands, that's on the Highfield campus. And there's one of the patch panels which is in one of the core areas, so again this is predominantly going off to the, to the edge buildings. There's actually quite a lot of, um, it's a blown fibre optic system, so you can blow more fibre through the existing cables without putting new cables in. Uh, you could patch the fibre that's in there that's spare. Effectively, you could make circuits all around the Highfield campus uh, and you could build a whole separate network or networks and things like that. Uh, and clearly, every single mode fibre can do you know, 1 gig a second, 10 gig a second, uh, 40, 100 gig a second, possibly more. You can multiplex streams on top of that. Um, you, could have, you could have terabytes of, of data down one single strand of fibre, um, in theory, if you put the right kit on the end. Um, the other thing that's part of our network is wide area circuits to uh, other remote campuses, which of course is, is relevant because essentially Boldwood is a remote campus. Um, it turns out we have some fibre to it, um, but the, the, the circuits we lease to many campuses come into equipment racks like this on the side. Um, our border firewalls that, that Simon was talking about and other people were talking about is a picture of the uh, Palo Alto firewall. Um, it's a chassis based thing and uh, for the main Highfield campus, we've got two of them, each one delivered, connected to one Janet link. Um, yeah, they are quite expensive. It's in excess of £100,000 for that thing there. We've got two of them here, and we've got another one at, at close. And if you wanted to expand that, you know, you're talking, you could put another card in, maybe get more throughput, but again, you're probably talking, you know, probably getting off another £100,000, so it's a lot of money. Um, we're connected to Janet, there's a picture of Janet, as I say, Highfield, two 10 gig connections to Janet. Um, as mentioned before, we do have a data centre, it's a nice shiny data centre. Uh, there's a picture of some racks which appear to be unpopulated in this, it's quite an old picture, and there's a picture of the plant room with some uh, gas suppression stuff here and some chilled water tank here and stuff. I don't really know what all this is, but... Um, do you have the data centre out of seconds worth of it's in a secret location, yes. It was in a secret location. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, right. Which is not very secret. Uh, but yes, it's out there. So it's about eight, eight nine miles away from here. Um, and it's connected on, as you see up there, there's four 10 gig circuits uh, to Highfield campus and there's one 10 gig circuit to Janet. 
Uh, at the moment, the 10 gig circuit scanner is essentially there for disaster recovery purposes. Um, but the four 10 gigs to Highfield are in use. It's the main connection. Um, so how does it all connect together? Uh, basically, Janus at the top there. Um, we've got some border routers, small, small switch routers out there. There's the two firewalls on Highfield. There's the two core routers on Highfield. And here's the, the edge. And they would be stacks of switches, each of those. And obviously, the wireless hangs off that. We don't really have much of a distribution layer in here. Um, so some people would have a look at another layer of equipment in here. In general, we don't have that. It kind of exists in some buildings, but not hugely. Uh, the data center, I've drawn on this side. Uh, obviously, I say there's four links between, not, not just the two there. Um, it's a sort of similar sort of architecture, you know, but you've got your application servers here, and you've got your VMware and, and everything down there. So that's how we formed internally. And I just thought I'd throw this one up about this. Is a, this so this is the wide area circuits, basically the remote campuses, um, and shows how, they, how they're connected and obviously what's, what's relevant to you here. Um, obviously, you have to go pretty quickly. Is 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 kind of, you know, we are here, Boulderwood, Southern Gen Hospital, NOCS, WSA. Those are all on 10 gig lease circuits, back to higher fields. So they've got pretty good bandwidth. Um, Newviz is in building five. Um, we've already had some information about uh, how they how they're connected, but essentially they've got Cat 5e cable, or what is what they had. Um, and I thought we'd look at the, the typical utilization of the network. Um, here's a, here's, here is the Building 5 edge stack, and these are the links. This, this is the sum of the two links coming out of Building 5 most of the time. Um, not terribly heavily used. Uh, the core network, this is a selection of, of, of links coming out of there. These are probably some of the ones between the two cores at the top here. But actually, you can see 0%, 20%. Generally, this whole stuff is... is Relatively underutilized, underutilized, optimally utilized, perhaps. Um, the, the two Janet links that we've got, um, how are they used? Uh, we put all our, we pull all of our halls traffic down one of those Janet links. Um, just the incoming, um, and actually halls draws a lot more. Is rate shaped to four gigs, which is why it doesn't really go over four gigs. Um, but you know, there seems to be spare capacity on here. On, on this main channel link where traffic's coming in. What's the green line on that? Uh, that's outgoing traffic. So the hall's outgoing traffic actually goes out here as well. It's only these halls incoming. The, um, but essentially, those two links aggregate together into the firewall. And mm -hmm. so those two 10 gig links come into a single 10 gig link. Um, and if you add those two graphs together, this is pretty much what you've got. And, and it, it would appear we've got less capacity in here, three, but maybe we've got four gigs something like that free. Um, and the capacity of firewalls in total, they can do about 15 gigabits per second, apparently. That's the sort of... So internally, they shouldn't be restricted. Uh, so Richard did some tests. Uh, this is one of the early tests that he did on his one gig link. Um, and he got... Uh, yeah, he was getting on for a gig, gigabit per second. And he was fairly pleased at that. Um, but we observed some packet loss on the outgoing ports, on the one gig ports, um, 75,000. There's quite a lot of packets lost, which might be affecting his transfers. We're not quite sure. So we looked at that. Uh, we decided 0.184, that's quite significant packet loss, um, particularly if you were trying to do uh, large round trip time transfers. Uh, but we decided to move on and, and look at Perf Sonar to see what, see what potentially we could get. Um, we've got this mesh of Perf Sonar nodes. They all talk to each other, um, measuring loss, latency, and throughput. And, and Tim's talked a bit about that. And just to say um, where we plugged them in, you've seen the slide before. This is the, uh, the, the, the hardware spec, not particularly well chosen, perhaps. Um, but that, that's what it does. We've seen some graphs. Um, of the throughput, um, two to two, between two and eight gigabits per second. You can actually look at these yourself if you want to up here on, on, on that URL. Um, we can sort of flip through these. Possibly what I might point out is when we get to this one, uh, which is from London, from Janet to the external perf so now it's interesting we've got zero packet loss most of the time on here. So clearly there is packet loss in, occurring on the inside of our network. Uh, not very high, but it is significant. Um, okay, 
summarise some of the things there. Interesting thing we saw um, during the testing, we saw a sudden drop off in these throughput results, which we determined was down to a content upgrade on our firewalls that gets automatically applied, released and applied by the vendor. Um, and eventually it was removed by Palo Alto and, and the firewall was rebooted and performance returned. So it's an interesting thing that Persona was able to um, indicate to us changes in network behavior. And that's possibly quite important to, to, to pick out things because that was about a month's worth of low performance on the throughput that I Persona was measuring. But none of our, the rest of our 20,000 users noticed anything whatsoever. But Tim did actually on, on his file transfers he was doing. Um, so we moved on, we gave MuVis a 10 gig connection, we had some fiber, uh, we connected it. And I said to Tim, uh, sorry, Richard, call me Tim. Richard, uh, be careful, um, start off slowly because we're not sure what the impact of this is going to be. And it's safe to say our operations people were slightly concerned about 10 gig. Um, and they did get some alerts. Um, and they did phone Richard up and say, what on earth are you doing? Your system looks to be broken, it's generating lots of traffic. And they said, it's okay, Simon knows about it. And, <laughs> and the guy on the Which next... Simon name was he using? Yeah. <laughs> and the guy looked at me and I went, yeah, that's okay. Um, but the, the, the important thing was, yes, we noticed, um, but actually we haven't received any complaints that we can associate. Um, so that was an interesting concern. You can see a traffic uh, typical transfer here where he was getting four gigs. Uh, you can see the four different... Um, connections running concurrently that Globus was doing. Uh, what's this one showing? Oh, yeah, so it's, it was mentioned what was the firewall performing at. Um, this peak up here is about 9.2 gigabits per second, so we did get a fair throughput. And the previous one got how much? Well, on here? Yeah. yeah, it's a different transfer, obviously. Uh, well, no, this is, this is specifically the transfer um, it's just looking at the, the particular flows, this one. So this is just over four or five gigs per second, perhaps, peaking at. Whereas this is a graph of the uh, firewall external interface, the one which might be constrained, with where all the traffic is going through. Um, then we deployed an external Globus DTN. Again, this is not necessarily optimized uh, hardware, uh, but it's what we had to hand. Uh, Security concerns, we put some access lists on external switch. It's a, it was real test setup, uh, but we can, you can use it to do a few transfers. Uh, possibly doesn't have as much uh, disk as, as Richard would need to repeat some of his transfers, but I think we, we can do some transfers. Uh, and particularly, it can potentially be used as a sort of staging post for two-stage transfers if you're doing a, a high round-trip time transfer. Maybe it's better to do it in two stages. Maybe you'll get better throughput because there'll be low loss to the, to the DTN outside the firewall. There might be higher loss from the DTN to some internal node, um, but your latency will be low, so you can still get high throughput. That, at least, is a theory. So maybe this can be used as a staging post. Um, and the only real test we've done with this so far is to do a... Um, this was actually to our data center, and it was on, onto a very slow... Effectively, it was a virtual machine, so it didn't have great performance. But you see, if I did the transfer directly, I was only getting about one gigabit a second. Whereas if I did it to the external um, data transfer node, I could get this. And if I then went from the external to the internal um, host, I could get that sort of throughput. So uh, the kind of theory is, is kind of borne out that the higher latency um, coupled with the, the higher round trip time seems to give you this lower performance. Um, my observations overall, yes, you could upgrade the firewalls. Uh, it's quite expensive. Talked about, is, is, is that going to be worthwhile? Do you need that level of security uh, for, your, for your research transfers? Um, Perfsona has been useful for that, that anomaly type behavior. It's been very, very interesting. Uh, Globus DTN is pretty easy to set up. There is a desktop version as well, which is pretty easy to use to set up. We didn't observe any poor performance particularly. Um, at least not as far as the other users of the network are concerned. Um, that, that was quite nice. Uh, we haven't really done much at the t towards the data center at the moment, where, of course, all of our HPC is. 
um, and that would be an important destination for file transfers. That's something that uh, maybe Ivan's hopefully can help us look at. Um, and we, we've got a lot of infrastructure. We could build several different layers and organisations of science DMZ. We could we could pull new cables. We could use the fibre we've got. We could put it all somehow separately through live network equipment. And that, I think, is that. Um, Thank you. So can eat into the break a little bit, but yeah, any thoughts or observations? It, certainly, from my perspective, it's that it, it, it's that getting over you know all of the other operational things when you're doing experiments on a live network. It's, it's really quite hard to balance. You know, we've got business as usual, and then we've got these other kind of things going on. And yeah, I have to say, you know, whilst doing this. Um, I mean, some elements of it I, I kind of kept a bit quiet from the operational team because I was aware that they might stick up their hands and say, you can't do that. So I have to, I have to raise a change request to deploy a node or configure a switch. And I'm thinking, well, how can I phrase this so they won't put their hands up and go, but this is not a standard offering. How, you know, how, how are you going to do that? So um, we, didn't, we didn't break any rules, um, but... <laughs> It's all about phrasing things in the right manner, I think, isn't it? And, and yes, I was, I was slightly concerned about what the performance might be and what the impact might be. I said, take it carefully, Richard, and i pleasantly pleased. I mean, Simons isn't on this same thing. That's another area we could actually expand to, I guess. Um, and I think we've talked about that, Andy. Richard's, yeah, so there's a, that's another avenue we could explore. And originally we thought, is it Richard, is it Simon? And Richard was the one who said, yeah, I'll go with this because I've got real pain. So. Yeah, I spoke to Simon, so I think Richard's got the bigger data requirements in terms of performance. I, I suspect so, because they do small models. Yeah. 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 So if you are interested in getting the physical system, you've got to have the physical system. Oh, yeah. I can't speak for Simon Coles, but um, our group is writing the new uh, sample management portal for the National Crystallography Service. So, if you know, we're the guys to talk to if you want, perhaps wanting to get Simon involved and in, in interface with that. Scale of data you have. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not at the same scale as Rich's. It's a, it's a few tens of gigabytes rather than. Yeah. Yes, in in general, we, I don't think we see other people doing stuff at the no, moment. Don't, we don't see massive peaks. Generally, we're fairly it's smooth. It's a good idea to instrument the network with persona. I think it is. I mean, because I was just, we were just having a chat with Ivan, really, about one of the things is if you have some sort of problem, how do you investigate it? And um, someone like Richard, if someone like Richard comes along and says, oh, I've got a terrible performance problem today, to the operational guys, they go, well, you're one Ethernet connection mm -hmm. out of 20,000 or something like that. Everyone, nobody else is complaining. So the scepticism mm -hmm. from the start... Um, and actually, if you've got things in place that are measuring, then that's kind of owned by the operational teams, um, and they can look at them. And, and if there's some deviation from what was happening before, then they're likely to go and investigate it. If, if they're getting something new, it's not investigated before, and there's no previous baseline, you know, they're going to be trying to close that ticket. That's, that's mm -hmm. just the way people are, really. Mm -hmm. So I think more instrumentation, instrumentation you can get, um, the better, because it takes effort to pull that in and manage it and keep it up to date. Simon, I'm, I'm curious about the, the packet loss reports. Do you, I appreciate it's difficult to diagnose in detail, but do you have any feel for whether, it, whether it's widespread or whether it's localised in some sense or whether it's related to short-term burst structures or some buffer depth? The, the stuff that we saw inside the network? Yeah. No. <laughs> um, if you go to the firewall, you can show various statistics. There's not that many you can show on the firewall. If you go to our core network switches, they're packed with statistics. They're packed with error counters, discard counters on the external interfaces, on the internals, on the back plane. What do they mean? Are any of those relevant to the transfers? Or, or are they all something to maybe you know, they were just um, failed pings or something like that? You know, what do the counters relate to? You get into the internals of the, of the network. Is, you can look at the interfaces, interface stats. That makes sense to most people. So much of this could be occurring within the equipment, and there's loads of counters. 
and I don't know what you'd make of those counters. So Martin what you Zerfer. said wasn't necessarily the uh, the loss at the interface, which is what the kind of stat I would have seen typically. And what we, if we saw numbers on the inside of Janet, we'd be scared if we were getting lost like that, because we normally it runs without any any loss. We have enough headroom to avoid that, which is what makes it work. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, by extension, if we've got uh, the the local land context where at some level you're getting lost, that's that can be an absolute yeah, I mean, killer, not, as we all know. Yeah. Instance, we don't see errors on the actual interface. We don't see interface errors. Generally. Generally, I did have the, an example there when we were oversubscribing a one gig link. But, but in general, the, the, it's not those. It's not errors on the interfaces. So those packet losses are recurring internally somewhere. Ah, oh, that is interesting. Uh, I don't know if they'd be in the core or the edge or the firewall. I mean, the firewall, firewalls generally, people would say, yeah, it's a good target for looking at. Um, I think you, you, if you really want to understand that, you, you, you need to be getting back to the vendors. Yeah, and your supplier possibly wouldn't even know the vendors would be looking into that. And I think that's one of the reasons for the, the DMZ. It's, it's this argument that says, blimey, that's complicated. Oh, look, zero's there. We'll just, just feed off that. Just, and that's where this bypass concept comes in, isn't it, really? People uh, just go, that's uh, too difficult. Make it easy. I'll make a couple of observations when I talk later. Yeah, yeah, that would be Chris. Yeah, so I, I was going to ask quickly, I noticed that you had four transfers running, each of which looked like they were under a gigabit. Is that a, f an in, a limitation of your firewall internally? And Not so, no. <laughs> um, I can't remember if you showed it in the diagrams. Did you put the perf sonar node inside or outside the firewall? Or did you have one? Uh, there's one outside the firewall, and there's one... Um, effectively in building five. What was that? that one. So there's one, there's one here outside the firewall connected to that switch. Um, and then there's this one which is connected to the same switch as Rich as uh, DTN. It's not actually in building five because there was no space in building five. So it's, it's off on five or in a different building, but um, that's where it's connected. And did you do any um, hardening on the external node, or did you just let set a username and password and kind of leave it as defaults? Uh, on the Perth Sonar, uh, well, obviously it's got, yeah, it's got username, password. It's there is some, I think, access. Yeah, I've got access lists on here. Um, to identify, uh, I mean, this is, Perth Sonar is just running things like iPerf. It's just running other tools, so you can find out what the ports are, and it's just them. Based access so, no, lists. Um, uh, IP tables, tables, yes, it does. Screens, yes, it does. <laughs> so, yeah, we really just installed from the ISO, and that's pretty much how it comes. It is designed to be hardened. It's it's designed for that sort of deployment out in the wild. Can, can you use this sort of network monitoring stuff to actually detect which devices on campus have been taken over by botnets, being used for spam and things like that? Not the person. No, not the, no but, 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 but can you identify where on your campus you're getting large amounts of... There is, there is the ability to understand some of those things that are happening, whether they're coming internally and they cause spikes, but actually just do a really good job at stopping some of the external stuff. There's quite a lot of stuff that's got rid of before it even gets to us. So the, um, there's the, a certain amount of stuff within our setup. No, I was always impressed. I went and saw the switch, the Swiss National NREN, and they used to each day call up the IT officer at the university and say so and so machines have been compromised. Well, yeah, I, I, I realise that. No, to some extent, um, the reason I'm pausing is because it, it's a slightly different area to what we're talking about. But the the, uh, the the firewalls. I mean, these Palo Alto firewalls are application layer firewalls, so they're aware of applications, not just ports. They're doing all of the stuff to detect malware, um, botnet traffic, um, command and control traffic. It's, just, it's, it's, it's similar to the, to the stuff you get in your anti, antivirus on your firewall, and that's why things are downloaded and updating daily um, or more frequently. It will scan files, it will blow files up, and it will look at them and do all sorts of stuff. So they're, they're very advanced devices. There is information, so there is information from there. Um, on the whole, within our network, not a lot of that information coming through. We don't have that much anti anti spam stuff. Just worry about the Russians. One but, uh, very quick point, just right. to yeah. Simon, uh, could you give us a, an idea about how much time and cost this all took? Uh, 
it probably took a fair bit of time from my perspective because I'm not a, a systems person, so deploying persona is just not something I've really done. Mm -hmm. I don't really deal with ISOs and images and things. <laughs> it's bread and butter for the people. I've I got something else to do with this. But, and it was over quite a long period of time. I mean, I, must have, I would say I've probably spent at least two weeks full time equivalent doing this, but it's over a long period of time, so it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit hard to judge. Um, I mean, the cost of these boxes, they're, they're reasonably old boxes now. Um, I don't know, a few thousand pounds each is, 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 is all they would cost, but um, we just reused what we had. We'll just get Andy mic'd up. Well, that's a really good example, and, and I, I'm, I'm so appreciative. I mean, often IT is seen as, you know, saying no to lots of things, but actually, um, I've, I've been saying a long time, you know, there should be this sort of innovation partnership between iSolutions and the research community, and so on, you kind of deliver that in space. So I'm really, personally, I'm really appreciative that you kind of went out on a limb to do this, and it was a really great talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got a little bit of um, of buffer time. These these network jokes keep keep coming. Um, they, they don't they don't get any funnier either. Um, so actually, we've eaten to a little bit of time. And I thought having the conversation um, carrying on was was worthwhile. And we've got the the panel session too, so we can catch up a little bit of time. So, but without further ado, then the other side of this um, whole chain was actually um, the diamond light source, and um, Andy's going to tell us a little bit about kind of the other side of, of the story, having heard about, if you like, the machines here, the usage here and the networking, well, this is the third part of that story. So, yeah, over to you, Andy. Thank you, Simon. Um, so, my talk's going to be a little bit different because we've heard a lot about um, sort of technologies to transfer data and so on and so forth, and actually, actually going to sort of try and put it a bit more from the user side as to what actually happens at Diamond and what the reasons are for doing this kind of stuff in the first place, why we're so interested in uh, sort of data transfer zone concept, uh, and so on and so forth. So just by way of introduction, I'm Andrew Richards. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to email me, make sure, sure you put the J in the middle. Otherwise, you get my personal secretary, also known as the other Andrew Richards, who's in charge of legal services, who is the best spam filter you can ever have when, uh, <laughs> when vendors try to get hold of you. Um, so my, my group uh, in Diamond is focused on the, on the infrastructure. So we, we underpin all the infrastructure across Diamond, uh, at the sort of IT level, except for the corporate IT group. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in, in, due, in due course. <clears throat> so, uh, quick intro to Diamond. Uh, back in the 1940s, it used to be RAF Harwell. In those days, they used to fly data in and out in airplanes, but since then, uh, they started to do things a little bit differently. And today, we're actually on, for those of you that have perhaps never been to this site, we're actually part of a, a, a much larger Harwell campus uh, as it's now branded overall, and we sit particularly alongside these other national facilities. So it's national facilities like ISIS as well, the neutron source. But from our side, it's alongside national facilities like the Scientific Computing Department, which sits here in this building here, R89, just as you come into site, which for us is, is a group that we work alongside closely for archiving of data and, and looking at how we might uh, sort of do joint ventures around computing and processing and stuff in the future. So, you know, th th this is a sort of large campus activity. We're not just doing, you know, all of the things that we do in, in isolation. So, Diamond is, is a synchrotron. We're, we're a bright light source. We accelerate electrons around these three accelerators to generate light. Predominantly X-rays is used on most of our beam lines, with the, although we do have one which uses uh, the infrared part of the spectrum. And, and we now currently have uh, around 30 operational beam lines at the moment, uh, which are all uh, sort of, you know, some are similar, some are very unique, but they're all end stations at which users come and spend time and, and generate data. On a number of these beam lines, people are now, particularly on the life sciences side, people are remotely accessing the beam lines to steer the experiments and do things remotely so they never actually physically come to site. And we do now have one beam line that is really set up just to never allow users anywhere near it. You ship your samples in, we do all the work for you, and, and we tell you when the results are ready. And that's the kind of direction of travel uh, that Diamond is moving in, in a sort of more general sense, to sort of automate the whole throughput and get more throughput, more work are going through the synchrotron over time. So, you know, we've got a whole range of beam lines. We won't go into them in great detail today. We're still building some of them. We'll be 33 operational beam lines when we finish. But in addition to this, 
across a whole range of areas. In addition to this, uh, some pretty pictures here, we also now have a growing number of electron microscopes which come under the diamond sort of operational banner. So two additional entities were created. One was called EBIC and one was called EPSIC. Uh, a lot of the attention is often given to EBIC, the Electron Bioimaging Center. The physical sciences one, which is only a couple of microscopes, tends to get a bit more forgotten about because this is really the flagship activity. Uh, but this is a, a constantly growing area. You know, e even when I joined Diamond a year and a half ago, there was only kind of, you know, sort of a couple of the big boys, uh, these, the big cryo-CMs really sort of operating. And now there's kind of, I think there's supposed to be officially before cryo-CMs, but there's actually more cryo-CMs on the way which are under different agreements and going to be used in some slightly different ways, which will fall under this overall banner. Um, they are... They have a dedicated building, which is in, uh, being filled up quite rapidly. It's, it's actually where, when the next one arrives, will actually now be full. Uh, and, and these are, from our side, treated in the same way as beam lines. They're generators of data, but they are you know, developing rapidly in terms of the, the way in which they can push data out of these machines on, onto our systems. So for us at the moment, one of these cryo-CMs, which are in the pictures here, will typically generate around about four terabytes a day, although you do see some EM centers around the world claiming that their, their cryo-CMs are generating 25 terabytes a day. A lot of that depends on what software you're using and so on and so forth. In all the areas that we're working at the moment, the, the guys doing the software for this are, are really sort of changing the mind almost on a week-by-week -week basis as to whether they should be using, you know, 4-bit depth files, 8-bit depth, 32-bit depth files. The software around this is changing, which has big implications on the data rates coming out of these things, then, which then, then impacts us. So, <clears throat> from a user's point of view, those who do actually come to site, what they'll typically interact with is something like this. They'll come, they'll spend time in, in, in what looks like an office, a beamline hutch, They'll sit down in front of a workstation and they'll spend 24 hours without seeing daylight, um, pressing buttons on some software, largely uh, ignorant, perhaps not the right word to use, but largely unaware of what's going on in the background in terms of the, sort of the underlying infrastructure making it possible for them to acquire their data. Uh, you know, software that looks like this allows them to do various things. But on, on, what, what they're actually doing is driving a range of experiments which is using a range of different detector types. So this is just some examples of the different detectors that you might see across beam lines. But what we are seeing is that you know, the detector technology is also changing at such a fast rate that we're going from detectors that only really a few years ago were doing tens of frames per second to detectors that we now have which will be running at 750 frames a second in the very near future and detectors that we're actually having to put 40 gig links in down to the beam lines instead of the 10 gig links that we currently have to sustain the data rates coming off these because we are seeing detectors that are now coming on stream that can quite easily saturate a 10 gig link and, and in the very near future we'll be able to saturate 40 gig links in terms of the amount of data that they're generating. So there's a whole separate discussion we could have around that about how much data people should be throwing away and perhaps doing some smarter things closer to, to the detectors to you know, discard the useless data. But you know, this, this is the sort of scale of the data challenge that, that's coming across uh, a number of our beam lines. So pretty pictures. Uh, other things driving up our data rates are things like robotics. So as well as the, the sort of the, 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 the sample, the, the sort of cameras, if you like, changing, uh, a lot of our beam lines are also looking at how they actually get more samples through their beam line per day. So robotics are changing that as well. Diamond has actually taken commercial robots and taken to pieces and rebuilt them because Diamond knows how to build them better than the original manufacturer and has made the, robot, made the robots go faster. So we get more samples done per hour. And also people are moving to different techniques. So rather than just having, say, in the, in the, in the crystallography beam line, sing, single protein samples on the end of a nylon loop, putting them one at a time into the beam line. They've started to put their samples on what look like plastic plates with multiple wells in. So you put the whole plastic plate in front of the beam and then you sort of iterate through each of the wells in turn. And all these subtle changes are, you know, help to drive up the overall throughput. So again, what that means from our side is that we'll see some beam lines where in a sort of, you know, typical weekend, a 48-hour period at a weekend, might, might deal with one sample because they've spent a huge amount of time trying to figure out how to position the sample, what best to do with that sample and, and what they really want to do. And by the end of their Sunday, they've managed to analyze one sample all the way through to other beam lines that have really got this automated, just doing protein crystallography, doing very routine operations, where by the end of their Sunday, they've done you know, two or 3,000 samples in, in that same kind of time. And all of these aspects drive up, drive up the data rate. 
and the EMs are, are, are sort of similar as well. So at the infrastructure level, what we want to do is to make it as easy as possible for our users then to not only come and collect the data, but to be able to then analyze that data and then get that data away from Diamond to do their anal analysis somewhere else. And that was very much the original kind of concept of how someone would come to Diamond and use it. You come to site, you bring your sample, you collect your data, you put it on your hard disk and you go away and, and we never hear from you again. But unfortunately, times have changed and we're now getting to the stage where a lot of our users uh, just simply cannot take the data away with them on, on a hard disk anymore. In, in the crystallography side of things, it is still possible. A lot of people still do that. But particularly on the tomography and the imaging side of things, the data volumes are now so high that people just simply cannot walk away with disks. I mean, we have seen people literally come to Diamond with a suitcase full of USB 3 hard disks, expecting that over a sort of, whatever, three or four day visit period, they will be able to take away 78 terabytes of data by copying it onto, you know, 20, 30 separate hard disks and walking out the door with their data. And that's just simply not going to happen. So for us, this is driving two things. It's driving, um, well, let's skip through some of these. We don't know if these are less irrelevant. So th th this for us is driving a number of things. One, it's driving the fact that we, as the data rates increase, have to look at our network architecture internally so that we start to put 40 gig links in place to get the data from the end detector, in this case a microscope, all the way through to the central storage so that they can do some analysis. But it's also making us look at things like the data transfer zone concept, which is why we put it in place, so that one, we can help people get their data away from Diamond to somewhere else so that they can further do their post-processing post, post either at their own institute or some other location in the future. Or we have to, or, we ha or increasingly, we have to look at what additional resource we provide on site to allow people to come back to Diamond and continue to do their post-processing at Diamond. So this is the kind of dilemma we're in at the moment. At the moment, when you see people like Southampton who can now transfer quite larger amounts of data, sort of an order of magnitude more than they could before to here because of the work that's gone on here around the data transfer zone, then that's good for us because you take your data away and you can then do your processing here in Southampton. You've got HPC resources here, you can do your processing locally. But when we have users from universities that don't have access uh, to that kind of functionality and they are increasingly coming back to us now and wanting us to keep the data on our spinning disk so that they can do further post-processing of data in Diamond which then leads us to have to ask ourselves how much investment do we make in local computing infrastructure to allow that post-processing to happen or how much do we put effort into allowing them to take their data somewhere else their university or maybe the commercial cloud to allow them to do their post-processing somewhere else so all this discussion around this is very uh, sort of pertinent and, and interesting to us. So, uh, kind of randomly going through these slides, perhaps not in the order I intended, um, just to give you some feel of what we have on-premise at the moment, to kind of support what we do on-premise at the moment, we support a range of uh, sort of high-performance computing clusters, which are currently around about 3,500 cores, with uh, about 80-odd uh, GPUs tied into that as well. We've now got about seven and a half petabytes of spinning disk in our central infrastructure uh, and various other things which make it easy for our end users to then actually, whilst they're on site and remotely, log in and interact with all of this. One of the, one of the perhaps saving graces for us in terms of the data growth is that we only currently keep data on our spinning disk for 40 days. So we uh, tied in with the visit that you heard Richard talk about when somebody comes to do their acquisition. Tied in with the visit, we have the concept of keeping that data then on our spinning disk for 40 days. At the end of the 40 days, the only place that a copy of that data then exists is within the, uh, the tape archive, which is run by our colleagues in STFC, and we kind of consume that as a, as, a, as a service, sort of an archive as a service provided by STFC. So beyond 40 days, if people want to get access to their data, we ideally then want them to go to the archive, use the interface, pull the data down, and take that data somewhere else to continue post-processing. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is people, because they can't transfer it to their own universities, because they don't have good locations to transfer the data to, are increasingly then saying, can we restage it at Diamond? So we, are, we do actually, to sort of address some of these things, we've uh, let's just skipped through some of this. So to address some of this, we've uh, had to build another data center within Diamond at the moment to accommodate the growing uh, data rates coming off our beamlines just for data acquisition and in the short term to allow us to handle some of this post-processing demand within Diamond 
whilst we try to figure out how we can also help people to go and do post-processing somewhere else. And solving the network problem is part of that, helping people to go and po post-process somewhere else uh, as well. And so uh, just, this, just yesterday we had the sort of official launch of our new data center, which sits right in the middle uh, of the ring at Diamond. Uh, and this is relatively small. It's a new 30-rack data center, so it's not large. But this is really just designed, one, to, to, to tackle the, the increasing data acquisition challenge that we have and also to give us this bit of breathing space around post-processing needs whilst we try and figure out some of these other things and, and you know, encourage wider adoption of data transfer zones and so on and so forth so that we can you know, do post-processing away from Diamond and not have all of the expectation being that it's actually done, done at Diamond. <clears throat> so that was a, a kind of a very quick overview uh, uh, of sort of what we've got and, and how, you know, how, how a user perhaps interacts with Diamond. There's probably a huge amount more I could go into and happy to talk to people or answer questions about, about what, what we do actually do. I mean, I would just say picking up on some of the other comments around uh, sort of DTZ, I mean, we see it more as a data transfer zone rather than a DMZ because we don't have this real sort of hard air gap between what sits in the DTZ and what is internal. So our Globus endpoint, for example, that sits in the DTZ is there so that there's nothing in the way between it and the outside world from a networking point of view, but it sees all the internal storage. So all the high performance storage is fully exposed through that Globus endpoint. There is no uh, from a user's point of view, having to take the data from an internal location to an external location before they can onward transfer. So for us, the data transfer zone is very much about optimizing you know, the key services that you really need to expose to an end user, optimizing them in the most efficient way from a networking point of view so they can really benefit um, sort of, you know, for, from a data transfer point of view rather than trying to do this you know, complete separation of certain hardware here in a DMZ and other hardware here be completely behind the firewall. Alex is also here today from Diamond, who's done uh, a lot of the work on the DTZ, has been working with Tim and, and Duncan in particular on this. And so if you have real technical questions around this, then, then Alex is the person to, to sort of talk to. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Andrew. I'll hand over to Dave. Hi, Andy. That's, that's really fascinating. So your new data center is a sort of a, a buffer zone, effectively, um, and possibly fairly short-lived, given the rate at which things are growing. What I wanted to ask is, how many either organizations, universities, or research groups have you got in that category where they are now expecting you to provide these additional resources on their behalf? Because it strikes me that they, or the top, the top group of that, that larger group would be natural candidates for a, a conversation about how we might jointly help them yeah. to do other things. It, it, it's, it's an interesting question. I think it's, di it's difficult to say. So, um, you know, we, we, we see it changing all the time in terms of who wants to do it. I mean, particularly in the tomography areas and the imaging areas where they have a challenge in taking data away, then they are, are you know, large people who want to keep data on disk and do more work at Diamond. I mean, in some of the tomography areas, we now have the, you know, those beam lines have set up the concept of a data visit, so people can actually physically come back to Diamond and get expertise on site to help them further analyze data. So you know, in some cases, it goes beyond just where the data is. It's coming back for expertise. But in other areas where there are good endpoints, then you know, uh, we were just looking at the statistics before this presentation. And right now, as we speak, we're running at about 5 gigabits per second. And most of that connection is dominated by someone transferring EM data as we speak from Diamond to Cambridge. Yeah. Consistent defenders or recurrent groups mm, demand. There are. There are. <laughs> yes. So to the short answer, yes. <laughs> okay, well that's a very helpful overview, and obviously Alex is here as well. So um we've eaten to a little bit of time, but I think actually if we just um come back, if we nevertheless take twenty minutes, there's some coffee, tea and, and water in the room that we're in, then it gives people a chance to talk to um anyone in a little bit more detail, particularly Alex who's also taking the time to uh come up here today. So thank you very much, Andrew. That was great.
So, so it says I have to sign it. Uh, okay. Yeah, shall I sign it with my mother? You might have to sign it. Yeah. Yeah.
Where's yours? Uh, it's the one that ends in Walker. Oh, here it is. There we go. Excellent. Um, okay. So you'll just want to tuck that into a pocket. Uh, where does this? Where does the mic want to be? There. Yeah, maybe slightly further up. Okay. F five, usually. Okay. Is view. Okay. So um, I think the slides just co we're just coming into the uh, final okay, session um, where we've got Chris Walker, um, David Salmon from JISC, and then. Just an opportunity to have a discussion um, uh, at the end. Um, but having had um, live demo, Chris, Chris has sort of tipped me the wink about audience participation. So maybe I should go and sit right at the back. Um, no, but, no, we need you at the front. Ah, uh, OK. <laughs> um, well, Chris, let's uh, hand those coming from um, Queen Mary uh, uh, University. Um, hi, I'm Chris Walker from Queen Mary University of London. Um, and I'm going to give you a talk about uh, the experience in optimising data transfers. Now, um, my I'm a physicist by training, and actually originally I did synchrotron radiation, so I worked at ESRF in Grenoble and Spring 8 in Japan. Um, a lot of this talk, in fact most of this talk, is from experience working for GridPP, for particle physics, uh, and their data, data transfers, but there's one or two lessons uh, that we can, that from much more recently, um, that we can pick up. So I'm going to begin by setting some expectations. I'm going to give a bit of a demo of TCP IP and how it applies to large data transfers. And then I'm going to give some war stories of the bottlenecks uh, we've found and fixed and how we've fa found them. Um, we'll see how much time we get for that. Um, so motivation, the LHC at CERN, there are many and varied pictures of the Atlas detector. This one's really good because it got me in it. Uh, there are collisions every 25 nanoseconds at CERN. The raw data rate is, I believe, about a petabyte a second. Uh, but most of that data is thrown away by various levels of triggering, so they generate about 100 petabytes of data a year. Um, and Queen Mary receives some fraction of that. Um, so... Tim set some network expectations, but you know, with 100 megabits, you can transfer a terabyte in 30 hours. So that's the connection I have um, at Queen Mary to my desk, 100 megabits. Many places you've got a gigabit, and HPC, you have typically got 10 gigabits. And if you saturate that, you can transfer a terabyte in 20 seconds. But it takes quite a lot of work to achieve that particularly over long distances. And as has been alluded to earlier, you need to find and fix bottlenecks, so you need to make sure that you really do have 10 gigabits from A to B, and you need to find and fix causes of packet loss. Uh, if you come away with nothing else from my talk, fasterdataes.net is an excellent resource in how to, um, in all of this. Uh, I have Stolen one or two slides, some with permission from them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, in 2012, uh, we were doing quite well. Uh, we were managing to saturate the college, uh, our gigabit link. So the college actually had three gigabit links, one for particle physics, one for the main campus, and a resilient link. And um, uh, this kind of scared Janet into... Um, Maybe we ought to have an upgrade. Um, and anything that could go wrong did go wrong, but eventually we got our, our upgrade. And so we were, in 2013, we were achieving up to about 8 gigabits per second on a 10 gig link. I should say that Queen Mary engineered it so that the Mile End main campus, uh, where the particle physics cluster was based, uh, all the particle physics tra traffic went out, out over that link, and the rest of the campus uh, traffic went out over the Whitechapel link. So there was some separation, and only in cases of failure uh, would the two sets of traffic mingle. Uh, particle physics, as I guess you know, 
is worldwide collaboration. The sun never sets on the LHC. This is a quite a US-centric uh, diagram, but there's the UK, uh, India, the States, Japan, and Australia. So really quite long distances. Now, what sort of level of traffic can you transfer? Well, I thought I'd look and see what ha was been happening in the last month. So this is ingest and egress out of Queen Mary. And you know, we're getting up to 30, 30 40 terabytes of data per day uh, transferred in or out. Uh, most of this is out. Uh, and to a variety of destinations. You can see here sort of transfers to Spain. Uh, this is, I think, France. But it goes worldwide. So particle physics can do that, but there are some, going to be some researchers in the room. And actually, a lot of people like RSync and SSH. So I thought I'd see how good, so how well that performs. So I had a 100 megabyte test file. On the train on the way here, it took 30 seconds to transfer. With Edgy Rome uh, in the far end of the building, about 13 seconds. Earlier in the lecture theatre, about five seconds, actually. From my desktop, it takes about 10 seconds. And between uh, Queen Mary and our HPC cluster in Slough, uh, it, over a gigabit link, it took about two and a half seconds. And there's possibly some overhead uh, on that transfer. So if you have a huge amount of data to transfer, you need to worry about Globus. But actually, if you're a researcher who has a reasonable amount of data transfer, do, do start off with rsync over SSH. It's your comfy pair of slippers. It's not scalable to a really large collaboration, but for a lot of people, the network's pretty good. And actually, that um, the edu roam speed here is the speed one of the earlier speakers was transferring data at from uh, ESRF to, uh, to Southampton. So you know, the data can be pretty good. Right, now to explain TCP IP. So, uh, Tony, you can have some acknowledgement packets. So, TCP IP, you send a packet. So, if I give Tony a packet, he gives me an acknowledgement. Give him another packet. <laughs> he'll, he'll give me an acknowledgement. Now, uh, we can do that quite quickly. If, however, we need to get somewhere over here, it takes a little bit longer. So if I pass Tony a packet, he'll pass it back. And, you know, it'll take a little bit, bit while for a, a packet to come back. Now, what you then need to do is say, well, OK, so to get decent transfer speeds, we need to have a couple of packets in flight. And so on. So you need a reasonable number of packets in flight, so your buffers need to be big enough. Now, this is... Um, this is the buffers on the intermediate routers? Will be the buffers... The amount of... The buffer in your application, so the number of packets that your application is prepared to have in flight. Now, between Queen Mary... <laughs> well, um, if, we, if I pass packets to you, Tony, and we lose a packet, actually we can recover relatively quickly. If it's a long distance path, it takes us that much longer to recover. And it is hugely more critical that, um, uh, in terms of performance impact. The other thing is, actually, we might have a resilient link. So we can send packets this way, and they'll go through different paths. <laughs> and um, you, you kind of get the idea. And some of us are... Uh, I'm extremely brave, uh, and so we also tried with jumbo frames which sometimes wouldn't get through some network links but give potential performance impacts. But the key thing I want you to... 
And, <laughs> and indeed, you get fragmentation and, and so on. So um, you, you kind of get the idea. But the key thing I want you to come away from is uh, that the number of the volume of traffic in flight can be quite substantial. Um, round trip time to the US is about 100 milliseconds. So if you've got ten, a 10 gigabit link, and being a physicist, that's about a gigabyte per second, um, you've got um, 100 milliseconds worth of traffic, so a tenth, uh, a thousandth of a second, that's about 100 megabytes of data in transit unacknowledged. So your TCP IP stack needs to be able to cope with that. The default Linux stack at 10 gigabit speed is actually, or the scientific Linux or CentOS Red Hat, um, is fine, I think, within the UK. But if you're going into continental, you need uh, high, um, high data rates, you need to worry about that sort of thing. You also need to worry about the application. So a couple of examples. Uh, the US example I've given. Uh, Taiwan, it's 273 milliseconds. So you've got half a CD's worth of data in transit unacknowledged uh, for your transfers to, uh, to Taiwan. Packet loss has a huge impact as you go over longer distances, and this um, I think you've uh, discovered in Southampton. So on the LAN, you, know, you, you go from a 10 gig to, you know, to 7, 7 gig, not, not a huge problem. At 10 milliseconds, uh, you've reduced that speed to about a gigabit. So you've got a factor of 10 reduction. And 10 milliseconds is about uh, the distance from London to Scotland, London to Glasgow-ish. Um, David, uh, give all... Uh, I'm a physicist, David. But it, it's, about, it's about that, ish. Yeah. Sorry, round, round trip time, yeah. Um, and that's set by the speed of light the speed of light in glass, the way that the fibers root, and a small amount of buffering and processing in, um, in the routers al along the way. So I said packet loss is really significant. You can mitigate that a bit by having multiple streams, either by transferring one file with multiple streams, as Globus does, or by transferring multiple files at the same time which might be a, is an alternative way of doing it. If you push that too hard, you can impact other unis, users within the university. Um, so the lessons are uh, make sure that TCP buffers are big enough uh, and find and fix causes of packet loss, which can be really difficult to do. Your application needs to have large enough buffers um, and use multiple streams, as Globus Grid FTP does. Um, Aspera uses UDP, and so isn't uh, quite so subject to this scaling back uh, that Grid FTP is, uh, that TCP is. But you then need to be quite careful about how high you turn the knobs up, otherwise you will flatten the network, and your colleagues will not be very keen. Um, again, faster data, ES.net has some good recommendations. But coming back to what I said before, if you've only got a, f a few gigabytes to transfer up to a terabyte, actually within the UK, actually probably SSH and Grid FT uh, SSH uh, and RSync are probably good enough. So, some war stories. Uh, we recently moved our, data, our HPC cluster to Slough, and we have just bought a new TSM server. And we have a resilient Layer 2 link from Slough to Queen Mary, where our tape library is. The round trip time is about one and a half milliseconds. So we did some tests, and you know, you'd kind of expect about a gigabyte per second data transfers. And the first time we tried it, we got 40 megabytes per second, and we were kind of a bit disappointed. <laughs> How can this be? So IBM set uh, for TSM, a default TCP window size of 63, uh, that's um, kilobytes, I think. And that's what's limiting this performance. So if you reduce it, which is easy to do at one end, 
um, because you need to control both ends, uh, you can reduce the performance. Setting it to zero, which says use the Linux defaults, we got back up to this transfer speed, which is essentially 10 gigabytes, uh, sorry, 10 gigabits line speed. Great, I thought. Now let's try our other host. And we had a bit of a problem, because there's two hosts on adjacent IPs, and that's the uh, iPerf used to measure the network performance. It's 9.6 gigabits. And the other one had 0.6 gigabits. And we eventually found that the, there was this amount of packet loss, 0.015%. And it turned out to be in a dodgy patch um, cable in Slout. Finding it was a right raw pain, I have to say. But once we'd fixed that, um, it went really well. So many in, that's one cause of packet loss we found. Many and varied are the times we found a 100, gigabit, 100 megabit connection. Our data transfer node was connected by my, my uh, now ex boss, 100 megabits, which was limiting things. The physics department thought it was connected to a gigabit, was connected to 100 megabit. The college put in place some measures to protect themselves against grid BP. And it kind of backfired a bit when they upgraded the firmware on the, on the switch um, because GridPP was fine on the gigabit connection or whatever. The college was sitting there on a 100 megabits connection wondering why the internet was slow. Um, at a previous event such as this, I talked to uh, Chris from NOC and he said, oh, I've got a problem transferring data to Archer. And I said, well... OK, maybe I can help. Why don't you set up some performance tests between Nock and Queen Mary and Queen Mary and Archer and to work out whether it's Nock, Janet, or Archer that's the problem. And it turned out to be within Nock. Talk to Chris for what the, the problems were. I've been told to wrap up, so I will uh, leave the war stories about firewalls, of, of which are many and varied, um, and tell you that our plans are to upgrade our firewall so that instead of bonded gigabit links, we've got a 10 gig module, so we should be able to be much nearer line speed. Uh, put in our data transfer node, and in particular improve our monitoring and join that perf zone our mesh and do some similar meshing with RIPE Atlas probes. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, large data transfers can be routine. Particle physics does it, but it takes quite a lot of work to find and fix those causes of packet loss. Uh, Monitoring is vital um, and need low packet loss and be good friends with your network team, which it sounds like you are in Southampton. And fast data at Eastern is a great resource. That's well, it thank me. you very much. Thank you. Well, a, a live demo, you know, never work with children, animals, or people will rip your network packets <laughs> up as they pass around. Are there any uh, questions or, or, or comments? There's yeah. some data. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Eli sometimes tells that using science DMZs solves some of these internet TCP IP problems. Yep. So the, most of the problems that I have found have been on the campus. They have been caused, inter you know, there's some bottleneck, there's a firewall on the campus, there's um, the 100 megabit links. Some, some tuning, yeah. um, so the science, and you saw the huge effect, impact that particularly for large distance transfers, packet loss can have. So what the Science DMZ is doing is or reducing or eliminating that cause of packet loss internal to the campus. I mean, as you've... You know, I mean, you, you saw that result quite clearly from the persona within and without the firewall, that there's, you know, a huge difference. And for short-distance transfers, that'll be fine. But if you're going into continental, that will have really quite a significant impact, potentially. Um, there is a formula in the book that Tim has handed out, uh, um, Matthias formula, I think it is, Matthias, uh, Matthias formula, that explain, that gives you what packet loss will cause what 
uh, impact. And I worked it out for the packet loss we had. But it's this, even what seems a really low level of packet loss had such a huge impact. But finding it, I tell you, with a resilient pair of links from my, uh, Mile End to Slough, over, you know, there must, must have been a dozen network segments that were involved. Uh, Janet were very helpful in pinpointing where that issue was. Um, but it took, took a number of weeks to find, first off, discover that there was packet loss, um, and then to find the cause once we discovered it. Whilst we're just trying to find the USB stick on it, I was, <laughs> what I was go burning to ask was, can you show exponential back off by post-it notes? How does that version of the demo work? I, 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 should, have, I should have to try next time, I think. But yeah. Um, Theoretically, you could, though. Yeah, indeed, yeah. And, you know, different routing and different protocols, potentially, and different routes. Um, and, I mean, this was... So the issue was, actually, we had a resilient link. So the hashing, the two nodes had adjacent IPs. So one was hashed to go down one of the routes, and the other one was hashed to go down the other one. It was just fortunate that the one I initially tried is the one that didn't have packet loss, and so we got this really decent transfer rate. And I then thought, well, why aren't we getting it with the other one? It's, on, it's, it's got an adjacent IP address. It should be getting that good, good result. And what we did is we, I think the packet loss was, uh, was discovered, and then we tried some tests shutting down one of the links, uh, and that demonstrated that we'd got, um, that the packet, that, it wasn't a problem at the host, it was a problem with the, the links. We're, we're just finding the, the drive. Um. Any other comments or questions? Did you, um, the, have you got another war story whilst we're finding that? Because I oh, just what about Barclays Bank and oh, blocking. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so our network team our network security officer decided that we should have an intrusion detection system. And uh, uh, so uh, th th this was put between the firewall, uh, between Queen Mary and the internet. And fortunately, it was put only on the campus traffic and not on the particle physics traffic, at least initially. It, it now is. Um, so. I, I, for various reasons, wanted to look at the Barclays Bank website on one occasion. It just wouldn't let me in. And uh, I, uh, I could get on, at it on my phone. Barclays wasn't down. You know, I have an internet connection. And I talked to somebody from Networks who said, whose first suggestion was use HTTPS, not HTTP. And that solved the problem. Can, the firewall can't mess with it. Uh, so that was a problem. Uh, one of the particle physics academics emailed me at about 7 o'clock on a, on a Thursday afternoon saying, I'm desperate to transfer this um, uh, 10 gig file from Queen Mary to Rutherford. And it just won't go. It keeps stopping halfway through. Um, and I said, well, I can't help with that. But what I can do is I can put it on the particle physics system and get somebody around to pick it up, which is what happened. Um, but again, we, we did some debugging, and that was some... Um, infelicities within the firewall. Shall I just um, oh. blank this bit of screen um, just whilst you uh, do that bit? Yep. <laughs> um, um, so that was, a, that was a particular problem. And there was a performance bottleneck of, you know, from the 10 gig link we had, we could transfer data at 50 megabytes per second. And, and we were transferring data through this firewall at about one megabyte per second. I mean, it was a, such a huge impact. It has to be said that the network team were quite good at working with the firewall vendor. And they have been reasonably good at um, finding and patching this. Um, another issue is when we moved our stuff to Slough. I suggested, well, the network team had suggested to me, and it seemed like a good idea, that uh, we should connect Slough directly our computers in Slough directly to, the, to Janet and not go via the main campus in, you know, for resilience purposes. Um, what I hadn't quite appreciated is that meant SSH connections went from campus through the site firewall and into Slough. Oh. And um, 
we in ITS were getting a number of problems with connections dropped. They would drop several times a day. And that's a real pain if you're SSH'd into a machine and the connection's dropped. Mm. Um, and so where's the problem? It wasn't a problem before we moved to Slough. Must be the Slough firewall. And so I got um, a colleague to connect from physics to CERN and then back to Slough and run top on a machine in CERN and left it over the weekend. When we came back, four of the five sessions on his desktop had stopped working. SSH into the machine at, Slough, in, at CERN running screen. The connection between CERN and Slough was fine, so it must be between you know, the desktop at Queen Mary and going outside. Yeah. Um, and again, that problem has now been fixed. Um, but that was a right royal pain in the neck. And um, our users were not marvellously happy. We, we, in particular, were not marvellously happy with it. Um, so, I mean, I think that this is the, the beware of firewalls yeah. and, and intrusion detection systems in, in particular um, for causing these sorts of these sorts of issues. Well, and I also think that it shows kind of, you know, one of those aspects of how you run a performant network. There are so many moving parts that actually debugging things, what can go right, what can go wrong, is a very complicated skill. It's all too easy to say, oh, how many people do we need to support this network? Well, you'll it, erring it, on the side of caution is a, a good thing. It also shows the, the you've got several different people controlling different bits of it. And actually, it's really useful to get have places in the middle yeah. to measure performance from. Great. Okay. So, well, thank you so much, then, Chris. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. And I'll do some thanks at the end, just bef but just before Dave goes. Um, I, I do want to record thanks to, to Fran. Fran's got to drop some stuff back off at uh, main campus and do things. So thank you very much, Fran. I'll thank others at the end. But thank you so much for all of your help putting this together. It's much appreciated. Cheers. Thank you. Great. So, um, David, over to you to talk a little bit from JISC's perspective. Right. Yeah, sorry about the hiatus there. I never trust the basic technology. <laughs> Um, I want to say a little bit about research networking infrastructure and the JANIC context and then move on to some other points um, specific to what we're talking about today. Uh, there is activity going on on JANIC which is relevant to the future. Um, and then I'll touch on this area around the sort of the interface between JANIC and the organisation and then some broader comments on supporting research, if you like. I've piggybacked on the first part of a presentation that was made at, um, by our colleagues at the Net Workshop, our annual sort of networking event for the community, maybe three or four weeks ago now. Um, but I'm focusing on the bit that our division head, Jeremy Sharp, said, and, and not so much of the, the, the lower level detail that James and Rob would have touched upon. Um, if, you, if you want to ask questions about that, either uh, Tim or I can probably say some more about that. Um, this is Janet sort of as it, as it has been up to around now. The, but the diagram on, on the right hand, on the left hand side of the screen there is sort of indicative of what we've had in the past with the core network linking regional networks through which the organisations to connect to Janet. And on the right hand side here, this is a representation of that in a different sense from the organisations at the top down through the access layer into regional infrastructures onto the backbone and then onto various resources, either within the UK, elements that are embedded really deeply within the core infrastructure, like the data centre at Slough that Chris has just made uh, reference to, and then outbound through either Europe or beyond or to the commercial world and the general internet. So that's the, the structure of the network, and that's been like that for quite a long time now. However, those of you who have been around for a while will know that... Um, this purple layer, the regional infrastructure, for about the last decade or so, we've been slowly reintegrating the, uh, the organization of the regions into the Janet, corporately into Janet, with a view that when that was finished, we could then sort of begin to rationalize the infrastructure and deliver it in a, a technically more coherent way and actually with some significant cost benefits. And there's a stack of reasons there, you know, reducing complexity, standardizing the equipment. We now stand a, a glimmer of a chance of trying to get some overarching end-to-end -end management for service provisioning and uh, 
fault diagnosis, rationalization. Um, the old boundaries between the regions were in some cases illogical and now they don't need to persist in the form that they once were. Um, but actually the really strong motivator, and this is the, the, the very forward looking point for today, is that there's an aspiration to get fiber right the way to all the organizations at the edge, not just the top tier of research and data intensive universities, but ultimately to pretty much every organization that connects to Janet. And what has made this possible, or, or made us even think that this might be possible, given we don't have an infinite budget, is that recently Ofcom made a ruling that BT and OpenReach should open their fiber infrastructure th to third parties, much in the same way that um, the broadband copper was unbundled some years back and led to um, sort of broadening of the broadband market, if you like. So we want to get from the top diagram to the bottom one here, removing the regional infrastructure uh, th that's left now that we've reintegrated all the operational aspects. And the final point is a financial one, that this will enable us to crack this cycle of having to apply for you know, pretty large scale capital funding of the order of 50, 60 million every five or six years uh, and reworking our, our contracts more into a sense of continuous incremental upgrade and smoothing out the finance profiles given the way that the, the GIST subscriptions are, are heading with the member organizations. So it's a linking up of technical possibilities looking ahead together with practical constraints and potential cost savings. Um, this is a technical point, really, that um, we have to make sure that we're defensible in an audit sense. So in order to demonstrate that we were not going to go and spend an inordinate amount of money by doing this, there was a, a, a preliminary procurement to examine the strategy of doing this by means of which the commercial suppliers were invited to come in, offer solutions. They were scrutinized, uh, and they were deemed in general to be... Um, costly and lacking the kind of flexibility and agility that we want, might want in future to be able to deliver the services that are going to underpin the kind of data transfer requirements that we've been speaking around today. So we've justified a continued strategic approach of GISC build on the access layer in the same way as we've already established in the core of the network. And this really should, should play very strongly to future coherence. So this is the architecture that we are going to be building. And if you look on the far left there, you'll see some nodes marked core. That is the, mid, the core Janet network as we currently have it. Moving towards the right, you'll see two nodes marked RNet. Those are, those are the locations where the regional infrastructures connect with the, uh, with the backbone. And the two routers there are our, some of our, more, our larger scale aggregation points. If you look now at the uh, purple blobs around the edge. Those are the sites that we're trying to connect. And those are also IP routers. So purple to green is an IP service running over all of this underlying infrastructure, which will be Ethernet built on the underlying capacity within the fibers that we've engineered in the right kind of way. So there'll be a reduction in the number of routers involved in the exchanges over Janet, which should give us some benefits as well. Uh, the other Subtlety here, perhaps, is that the, these Ethernet ring architectures also contribute towards resilience. So if one of the, one of the uh, arcs of the ring should break, then the other one should be able to kick in, and there's a fast protection mechanism that will be implemented there, which uh, we've never done before. All historic protection has been done with BGP at the IP layer. So this is what's coming. Um, and we will be managing all of this direct. Um, I won't... I won't harp on too much about this. The, some of this technical detail in here is what, what BT has offered through OpenReach in response to Ofcom's mandate that we should open up the fiber infrastructure. There has been some wrangling on this. We haven't got the pure dark fiber that we wanted. People expect that eventually that will come, but there are some intermediate technologies which will do us as well that I'm not going to go into the detail of. But as a practical point of view, we have other procurements to give us access for dark fiber. So as we roll this program out across the country, we'll effectively look simultaneously at the cost of the BT product or at alternative dark fiber providers, and we'll pick the most cost effective of those. And then in future, um, I mean, th this is gonna take you know, some while to roll out according to the existing contracts. 
And then in future, we may have to do another iteration to get to the pure fiber goal, which is what we're aiming at. But I think in practice, with regard to the data and research intensive universities, this will not be an impediment. So what are the implications, um, implications for this from, from the perspective of an organization that connects to Janet? And I think in practice, this is going to be that over time, we will be presenting services on a new optical platform, you know, the, the classic IP services we have in the past, the larger dimension pipes, our so-called net paths or the historic light paths, Tony, the, the name has changed in a branding sense, but functionally equivalent. Um, so that we'll be able to get them very close to the campus infrastructure and also at some multiplicity if that is what is required. So there'll be a service mix, essentially, and probably a resilient service mix in most cases, um, arriving at the front door as a mix of these two service types. Um, and what's also been planned in is the ability within the equipment that we're buying that we'll be able to propagate large capacity, 100 gigabit per second, to the edge, i.e. to the site, where that's needed. Um, and just as a side point, within the backbone network, you know, in the, sometime in the last few months, we've commissioned the first genuine 400 gigabit per second channel on the backbone there. Now, there's intricacies on that that I won't go into here, but it gives you a sense that the whole network is moving, not just the edge, but the core in response to, to aggregate demand. Um, because, in fact, most of the existing research and data intensive universities and the national facilities such as Research Council Labs and a few others are already on or close to fiber, um, a lot of the detail is more in the subtlety of the way it's done rather than in uh, the, the, being specific extra services, although there will be equipment changes in due course. But I think the coherence of this program, when it's fully realized, should put all of this capability pretty much to, um, to the front door of any organization that connects to Janet when it's, uh, when it's finished. So this is where we begin really to, to, to bridge over to the main thrust of today's talk on this, the, today's, um, the theme of this meeting today is the, this interface between Janet and the organization, the services that we pass across that boundary and the way in which they serve research. And you'll see what I've done here is picked out an abstraction of a lot of the points that have been discussed earlier today. That if we bring these services to the front door in order to be effective in supporting the research work that's undertaken, we need a good LAN a good match to the land services. And the way that the hosted facilities are embedded within the land at whatever scale, be they um, a form of a research data transfer zone, whether they're an interface to a major facility that's funded by the research councils, um, or UKRI these days, whether that's Grid PP, Dirac, or whatever, and at whatever scale. So I think people wanted perspectives. One of the things I can see coming out of the kind of concrete work that's done here, that's been done in, in between Diamond and Southampton, is that if there can be agreement about the set of data movement services that run over these data transfer zones, then instead of trying to fill in every entry in what is of necessity a rather sparse matrix, then any newcomer that wants to come to the club downstream will just be able to implement one of these things and then should be able to exchange traffic effectively with everybody who's already in that ensemble. And to me, that is what the, the goal of this kind of, uh, kind of discussion around the effective throughput end-to-end -end and data transfer zones is about, that sort of uh, top-level um, concept. Um, given I'm pressed for time, I won't go through much of this in detail, but we are now beginning to talk to a, to a handful of sites where it's beginning to be a realistic prospect that 100 gigabits is the correct physical presentation. Um, I think the Dirac supercomputing initiative is one of the ones that's pushing these quite hard. The points I would want to bring out is that this will be a non-trivial upgrade, and what we're beginning to do is in discussion with the organizations and the infrastructure teams is to try and build up an objective case, A, that this is necessary for the research that's being undertaken, and have enough information that might then underpin a business case to get it put in place, given that it will require investment on the GIST side, but also almost certainly on the land infrastructure side for those organizations making this transition. Um, so conceptually in wrap-up, I don't believe there's any wide area issues that are an impediment to the kind of large-scale persistent data flows that we've been talking about today. 
the new infrastructure will give presentational um, advantages. We can possibly split services up in future in a way to give us the kind of mutual segregation that might help with uh, what Simon talked about in terms of some of the diagnostics internally, being able to partition all of this kind of stuff. But it will need planning on both sides in order to make this effective, and I think we're going to have to have more of these discussions of this kind of character to make sure that what we do is actually joined up quite tightly and meets the research requirements that lie behind them. That's what I wanted to say on the physical networking side, but we know, and today is an example of this, that actually um, it does need people to get together to talk to talk to each other about what's going on. And there's a point here which has bothered me for some while that in a formal sense, in NREN, Janet was, as JISC now, now has embodied all of that. There is, a, there is a very formal axis of the communication to do with contractual services, what we deliver to organisations, who pays what, under what circumstances, how does the schedule build up. And then, better example is what we're doing today, there's the kind of grassroots interaction, what I do, what Tim does, what some of our colleagues do in talking to and understanding what research communities want. But the thing I think that Today is a counterexample, but I think the thing that is often very missing is this point here. How do we better connect with what the organisation does internally to understand its own communities? What mechanisms does it use, and how better we can, can we join all of this up? Because I think this is a barrier at present. Um, and that, well, I've thought about this for a while. Um, as a tidbit, really, I'm involved and now chair uh, a European group on engaging uh, research I think this is a completely generic issue. The internet, two people are involved, Eli and other ESNet colleagues are involved in all of this. And I think we've all encountered this problem in one form or another. It's very under-resourced, there's no magic, but I'm hoping that through some of this kind of dialogue we will actually begin to get um, some understanding of this. And I think there was a comment from, from you earlier about the research software engineering. I think there's a very complementary aspect there too about linking all of this up. So I would hope that we can come to that meeting and try and learn more about that environment. Um, um, finally, just to wrap up, there is a, bit of, a bit, little bit of politics that's going on at the moment. Some of you are directly involved in and aware of that there is now this organisation called UK Research and Innovation. The Higher Education Funding Council for England has gone and disappeared, and it has been split into two bits, one called Research England, which is the bit of what Hefke used to do that runs the REF and gives money to the university. So that's an important bit. And then there's the more teaching and learning-oriented part that is now the Office for Students. The reason I mention this is that historically in JISC governance since it became a separate company, there was no direct input at the top level from the research councils into what happen, happens within JISC. JISC was owned by um, the... Universities UK, Guild HE, and the Association of Colleges representing FE. Detail not so important. Um, this is a strategic point, Tony, we touched very briefly on this earlier. There's various discussions going on, and I think you're involved at the top level through some of these advisory groups that are sort of, or, or have been. In, 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 ah, okay, but you've been involved in their analogues in the past, certainly. Um, Board of Trustees were a charity, that's less important. But what I wanted to show you here is that now there is a, a funders and owners group. The people who give money to JISC to make sure that all JISC's program happens, and I think it is still true to say that the Janet network still forms about 50% of what, what, the, what JISC offers as a service. But you'll note that now we have two people, David Sweeney, ex Hefke, but now Chief Exec of Research England, and Steve Butcher from the Office for Students are now formally part of this top-level governance structure on JISC. So apart from the kind of conversations at the more detailed level about integrations, the UK Tier Zero is how UKRI funds research and commissioned services, there is a way now in a, in a very formal way of closing the loop in a governance sense right to the top of the JISC governance structure. And if you note the function of this group is to provide advice to the trustees and the JISC management and just to flip back briefly to the trustees, you will say that this is a, a formal requirement for a charity, but you will see that the trustees are all senior representatives from within the uh, universities in the academic community. So um, very new yet. Don't know where this is going, but there are clearly op opportunities here for making things more co coherent. Uh, thank you. That's, that's all I've got to say. Yeah, <laughs> Questions or 
observations or comments? I mean, I think that whole perspective about seeing the way in which Janet is um, providing service and kind of upping its game in terms of that core infrastructure, I think one of the things that's actually on that next slide difficult to reconcile is, as perceived by the organization, Janet is both research and the education link, and actually some of those new structures don't necessarily play so well into that. It's, it's an observation more than anything else, but that's um, really important for us. You can't have one without the other one, and yet now they're in two separate places. Um, that's tricky. I, I, I'm sort of given, I've been, my first job in comms in the community predates the formation of Janet in 84, but you know, so I've seen it all grow up. Interesting observations like the backbone trunk speeds, uh, trunk, trunk rates, capacities have gone up by eight orders of magnitude in 35 years. Um, but I think the, the technical points I was making up there are important in the flexibility of presentation and a willingness to adapt the services that we provide around that to match what research needs. Those are discussions that we've yet to have, but it came up recently in one of the grid PP collaboration meetings, and I fed that back in. And I think operationally we're now amenable to things that we would never have done in the past, like routing two different channels and the IP sense to the university. If that's what's required and what makes sense, then we can do it. The thing that really worries me is that if we get fragmentation and we lose the critical mass, the thing will implode completely and we'll lose, it. we'll lose at least half a decade while the research side has to reinvent what we've already got. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you look at this board of trustees in the previous slide, I mean, how many people are focused on research? Um, I can't speak for that, Tony, but... Um, I don't see many research universities and I see, you know, Oxford. Yeah. Lancaster, I guess. Well, those might be maybe points that, uh, through through representation within SDFC, that you might you might communicate upwards with a regard to getting the, let's say getting the correct input from the aggregate of what is now UKRI back in to make sure that the research voice is heard. I, anybody who's in a, pos a senior position and is able to reinforce that message, I think that would be concerning. If you look at the next the previous slide. Uh, this, sorry, this, this one, Tony, or the final one? No, the, no, the one with the, the owners group. You see, again, you know, uh, it doesn't look very research focused to me. David Sweeney, that's about the only one. But I guess on the other hand, which is the point about the coupling between the research and the education, is if it becomes just, oh, we have this massive bandwidth just for the research side, suddenly within organizations. So where does research overheads pay for this becomes a question. Actually, it's a sophisticated mix of both the education and the research. And if you pull out one, you lose the other. And if you pull out one, you lose. So in a sense, actually, it's a much easier sell within the university. It's much easier for me to articulate this in terms of this is just the network. It supports our education and research. Once you start unbundling and saying, well, the researchers are the ones needing this extraordinary bandwidth, and actually education is just Netflix and halls of residence. What do we need it for? Actually, the two kind of link together. So actually, my point is there's <laughs> just understands the business and Janet in terms of the research side. But actually, if you start unbundling it, and education is paying a lot of the bill, actually keeping them together is much more sustainable um, and coherent. And that's I do sometimes say that to our research colleagues who may not care too much about the, the sort of the scale of FE and the load that comes onto us from that sector. But actually that's what contributes towards the critical mass that enables us to engineer in this way and enables the research side to get the benefit. Because I think if we did not have that, it would have to be done a different way. Yeah, and it would cause real focus on where the research overheads enable that stuff to be paid for. But it's, yeah. I, I think we miss something like uh, EOE and DOE because in order to send research data from Rutherford Lab up to Darsbury, it goes through the firewall, it's encrypted, it's decrypted, it's all the data packets. And it goes like the speed of continental uh, drift. But it need not be so, Tony. If, no, if SDFC were so. to make a policy decision that it could be otherwise, there is no technical <laughs> barrier to that. No, <laughs> I agree, but I, it might, I'm rather despairing of getting anything changed. Internally. Yeah.
Okay. Well, thank you very much then, David. Thank you. And just before, I think there are some drinks and things outside in about 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and we had scheduled at the end, I think we might need one more. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we might need one more chair. Um, we'd scheduled this kind of panel um, at the end with, uh, so Andrew, do you want to come up? Tony, Tim, and Simon. Um, and really, I know that we've sort of had a degree of interaction throughout and kind of comments and questions and, and reflections and other things, but I just thought it, we thought it would be useful. Yeah, yeah, grab a chair, don't be shy. Um, I thought it would be useful kind of towards the end really to get a little bit of a reflection on the day, um, or at least on the afternoon's worth of talks, but then if we want to have interactive discussion, we can either do that in this format, if people do have questions they want to um, throw in, um, or of course there's there's the promise of, of drinks as well in about ten bars. I think they're outside, aren't they? In the Timothy, yeah, so good. I think oh, they're yeah, sorry, yeah. Drinks are gonna be out yeah. in that room that we were in before in yeah. about twenty minutes. They're outside. So maybe just then to um, kick it off, perhaps just a minute or two perhaps of reflection on what we've kind of seen during the afternoon, sort of thoughts that have come from it. And then I can ask another general question and then perhaps open up. So I don't know who wants to start. I don't know, Tony, what are your reflections on the afternoon? My, my reflections on the afternoon is that this is exactly the sort of thing I wanted to see when I came back from the US. People actually looking seriously at these, these problems. I mean, uh, in the US you see people talking about sort of taking boxes of discs to the lab they use the network. And it's great that they're looking at that. And I'm also heartened by David's talk about JISC and, and the recognition of the, of the research needs. So I have, still have some concerns, but I think we're making progress. So I, I was heartened. That's nice. Thanks. Tim, you put a lot of effort into various um, bits yeah, of this. I yeah, what are your thoughts? Echo Tony's um, words. I think it's been great here. We've had a really nice mix of people from different areas and different backgrounds. And I think that's been really um, useful to get the questions then coming in from those, those people. Um, I think we did see that in the case of what we've done here at Southampton, you know, the, the network can be engineered to deliver um, really good performance for a specific use case. The interesting question then I think is how you scale that up, how you ensure the, you know, the data transfer tools, for example, are ones that the researchers are comfortable with, how if, for example, another three or four research groups on campus decide this looks good, we want to do this as well. What are the implications then scaling scaling that out? Simon, I mean, you, you, you got, got kind of into this game. From your perspective, seeing sort of the whole landscape laid out, I know you've got some view of it. What are your reflections on well, seeing think, what you see now? Well, I think it's interesting that, I mean, what we've done is kind of scratch the surface using what we've got and moving on, as Tim says, if we've got multiple people wanting to do this and even Richard wanting to do it more interactively with his experiments, um, then there is another stage that we've got to go to um, and quite how we then scale up I think is very interesting um, and I think the developments from um, what saying about David was saying about Janet developments with, with you know, multiple paths coming into these sites might be interesting and I'm actually quite interested in the sorts of technologies you're using there in, in the sort of metropolitan area, um, applying those potentially into our WAN network, which was quite ex extensive and, like all these things, quite expensive um, and will need refreshing as well. So, you know, if there are researchers at some of these other sites, and it will only be some of those other sites, you know, there may be other techniques we can use to connect them. So it's, I think that it's the next stage scaling up. Yeah. We've looked at how the data comes down actually we haven't looked at how you will then consume it um, how you will analyze it because if you're getting into a DMZ how do you get it back out again into something useful and I, that's the point where actually this starts costing real money I think yeah. I mean the metropolitan area network still exists at the moment B sort of <laughs> yes mm. Does That's a sort of concept. I don't know whether we're still on Toronto, but... Kind of <laughs> yes, in the sense, administratively, no, in the sense that we now manage it all. 
but of course we have contracts with life still in them so that we have to manage. What, what I'm describing in the sort of the technical and network evolution sense was the, um, the broad approach that we will take when those contracts mature and come up for renewal and we will replace it in a manner that's consistent with that national scale coherence. And we've got early opportunities to do that and some, some maybe have to wait for three, four years because the contracts that we, we have to one of those that are still in place. But there's a board, there were of order 18 structures to be dealt with and that's quite a big program over that time. But interesting things will be happening. Okay. Do you have to do higher education colleges and schools and things like that? We don't do schools directly but we do do FE although government policy has now mandated, I think, that FE makes its own choice about whom it connects to. So I think that notion of central funding has relatively recently disappeared, and we've been left trying to communicate that with the FE community. So we may see some attrition there, I think. And Andrew, I mean, we, we talked about this, I guess it was with Timothy as well, about this sort of heroic experiment. And I guess now you've seen some other bits of the pipeline. What are your reflections on the afternoon? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's very useful to see this kind of grouping come together and to see this take momentum and, and you know with particular sites like Southampton, uh, it still feels very grassroots. And I feel whilst there's a lot of understanding that we need to do this, and for people like Diamond, we want to encourage people to do this because, you know, uh, in the national interest, this helps us, uh, and it also helps your researchers. Uh, I just wonder how we go beyond the grassroots and people doing this as best efforts, and how we actually get some real funding into solving some of these last mile problems. Yeah. And some of this perhaps relies a little bit on um, expanding from those initial sort of heroic test cases to then going out and I'm sort of conscious that you're shy or, or after drinks. Um, but perhaps just to seed something, um, I, I don't want to put a microphone in front of Dave, but um, we were talking over coffee about some of the things that you were thinking of doing just to take this message out a little bit more. So I don't know whether you just wanted to say what you chatted about with me about kind of what was exciting and the way in which you might take this to other users in Southampton. Uh, my role um, within iSolutions is, is really to help innovation and development um, and we've got lots of people that could be using you know could be using these resources they could be using um, the HPC various other things but either they don't know about it or they haven't got the time um, and that that always seems to be a problem with you know the end user is getting something that they can use um, and use easily and to be able to communicate that throughout the schools the faculties and say look we have got this wonderful connection we can transfer data to here to there how much have you got what what are you actually doing at the moment because I, I know there are people that walk around with raid arrays you know they go somewhere they plug in their raid array they take the data they carry it home again um, you know, if we could replace that, if we can make it more reliable, uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, sure. oh, yeah, and I think that underlies this. I mean, it's one of the things David said: how you can the connectivity within the organisation, not not the technical, but the people connectivity within it. And yeah, did you want on, to on come that in front, on that? Dave, can I encourage you to come to the next meeting of the research software community? Yeah. So there's like, there were hundred, there was a hundred there at the last meeting people from all over the university involved with you know, writing software or using software in their research, those are the people you want to talk to. Come along. Elena came, Elena Vitaga from Iridis came last time and announced that, and um, Chris York talked about Git. They'd bite your hand off. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions or comments, or did you want to respond, or did you want to think about that, you know, that people connectivity, because you mentioned how you go from the grassroots, how you do actually scale up. Were there any comments from the panel on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things from the, the just, just point of view is where you know, there's enough people aware of what we're trying to do now that we get a number of inquiries and a number of contacts coming in. I think the more interesting challenge is the number of different disciplines that are now emerging with these types of requirements, um, how you engage with those. And I think you have to go out into, there's no point, well, I'm going to say there's no point, it's almost certainly better to go into the discipline and go to one of their events and just put your hand up and say, have you thought about this? This is the sort of thing you could do rather than say lay on event where you expect them to come to you so yeah, I, think that's I think from our point of view it's how we as just get involved with those disciplines i think on the campus point of view it's how you get out into the research groups and the departments to figure out who are the people that actually could benefit from this we happen to 
I don't even know, I don't even remember now how we got through to Rich, and it was fantastic that we did. I, it, we stumbled it, in there somehow. It, it, uh, I have it to, could well have been... It, it was partly because Rich, Rich, a long, long, long time ago, has gone to greater and better things. He was my post-grad. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I had a long... And, and I'm part of the Muvis grouping um, through other links within engineering. So well, Who were the other Riches out on uh, campus? And how that weren't my post-grads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, And, and it is that kind of reach. And in a sense, this event seeds a number of different areas, whether it's links on the HPC or in specific faculties. I noticed that the business relationship manager for what will be the big engineering faculty at Southampton combining the sort of heavy civil ship mech aero and also the electronics and optics and uh, computer science, the business relationship manager was there. So he'll go and say, oh, there's this stuff. But it's how you then scale and scale and scale that. Yeah. I think to some extent there's a, a sort of leap of faith required to get some of this implemented, isn't there? Because IT departments tend to have quite well-developed systems for creating well-thought-out business cases, and it all relates to sort of administrative systems and student systems. It's all quite well-developed, and I'm not sure the research world is catered for in the same way. So for their cases to be made, it's a bit more of a leap of faith, isn't it? And, and so there's some kind of internal stuff probably that... Yeah. Did you have a comment? Yeah, yeah, do you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. Um, so was, uh, Graham Ray from King's College London. I'm currently uh, in the process of setting up a uh, scalable high capacity data storage system for microscopy information. Um, and I'm getting back from our IT department uh, documents about where our planning is not meeting the policies. And one of them is in um, geodistribution for high availability data. Uh, I'm looking at object storage uh, particularly as a way forwards. And I've seen from a number of the studies that you've put forward here that places like Diamond Light Source are, um, you've, you've got a, a data center with uh, high availability and presumably resilience, but only at that one location. Now, Kings have been saying, we'd rather like you to, to put your uh, equipment in Slough. Uh, it's another JISC service, Virtus. Um, they're currently looking at uh, getting space in the AQL center at Leeds. So if we have an object store that's distributed between the researchers who are using it, Slough and Leeds, in each of these data centers, because of your erasure coding policy, you're already two-thirds or five-sevenths of the way to having your data in a rack adjacent to potentially a collaborator at another UK university. So by encouraging people to make use of uh, JISC and their services, you can get part of the way to, to, to reducing the amount of stuff you have to move over the wider area links. What does the panel think about this? Well, well I, I see that the large amounts of data are going to be produced by machines. I don't know if Southampton has plans to buy a cryo-EM machine. Yeah, that's one of the things that has that, come up on a number of areas. A year, and, and, and that's not in Slough at all leads. It's actually here. Mm. Uh, now, whether it needs to go off campus, the data, that's another issue. But you might if you want to do some analysis yeah. want to transfer that to data so it, it, it does I, I, it's good that you had the new viz here so you could look at both ways diamonds here and, and, and compare it with how you visited but, uh, Andrew did you want to yeah, yeah so, I, mean, I mean I think that the, the sort of model you describe you know once the data is in those three locations then yes it can be closer to end user but the data still has to get there initially you need effectively initially seeding it in one of those centres. You still need network capability between those centres to be able to do the distribution you know, with, with an object store approach. And, and so it depends what you're building that model for. If you're building a sort of an object store model in that sense to provide resilience, then the links can be somewhat slower than if you're trying to replicate the data in, in a more quicker way and make it more accessible at some endpoints. Um, object stores are something that, that are on our list in, in the very broadest sense. Uh, you know, first and foremost, the computer we have at the moment and the storage is very close to the machine. It's tightly coupled to the machine. If the, machi if, if, if the computer goes down, the machine's down, the synchrotron's down. And so there's this very tight coupling. 
But then there is the question, how can we get the data out to other locations like the commercial cloud or, a, or something like JISC so that it's uh, you know, more accessible for people who want to collaborate with data sets elsewhere? Yeah. David, yeah, do you want to comment? Let me just make a remark. I mean, I, I had a conversation with Jackie Palace at King's last December. CryoEM got mentioned and there's an action parked to, to go and have a more detailed talk. I had a similar one with Simon Burbage at Bristol. What strikes me, and I think Jackie may even chair this, there's a, an SDFC organised group on the, one of the collaborational projects on CryoEM, I think. There's a CCTEM. Ah, yes. right. If there's, I'm, I'm an outsider, but what I was going to say is that if there's mileage in this collaboration about um, gathering data from these sources in a common sense for mutual benefit, then if that case could be argued jointly by that communi community and then pushed upwards, it sort of fits what I detect about the shared national e infrastructure and you know aspects maybe of UK tier zero should elements of that part of the research councils be involved. I, I, I can't argue for it personally because I'm not close enough, but I can see ways in which cases might be made for the approach that you just outlined. But I think an interesting thing there is to try and get into that community. I lurk on, there is a CCPEM, is that right? Yeah. Mail list that I lurk on and all the discussion there is um, about the equipment itself and the research. There's nothing there about, well, very little there about storage compute and, and moving the data around. So I think if we're going to go and help that community, we need to perhaps speak to the, the likes of Jackie. And I have had this conversation actually with Tony in the break and um, try and move that forward as at a strategic level but we would need to get into one of those ccpem i think they have an annual meeting and go there and just flag it as a talk in their annual conference i did notice from their conference a couple of years ago there was a talk where the recommended way of moving data around in that talk was on hard disk so um, that may have changed but that's something that i think we can help uh, address so, so, so I mean, within Diamond, the Cryo EM community right now is encouraging people to use the global transfer tools. Okay, great. What, what's happening, I mean, on, in Oxford, they have two Cryo EM machines in the university, uh, as well as the ones at the Bullethead site. So, yeah, I mean, the, the ones in Oxford are really feeder microscopes in, in more of a sense, in the, and that they do some initial work there, and, and then with a the view that the data would be transferred to Diamond for further analysis or then doing further sample investigation on the, cry on, on the Cryos machines at, at Diamond. So there's a very close relationship under the EBIC banner there between Diamond and, uh, and Oxford. They're run by the same person. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't think they were doing that. But okay. Perhaps it's time for one last point. So yeah, Ivan, do you want to... Yeah. So yeah. a question from some users in the uh, Department of Medicine doing genetics uh, about 15 months ago saying, I want to share about, maybe it's about five terabytes of data with colleagues from UCL. How do I go about it? How do I get that? Well, I think really he'd like it to be sh uh, more of an R sync thing where they could see live updates, but just getting any of the data to them, how do I, how do, I do that? And I couldn't really give a good solution. Drop off doesn't go anywhere near that. Drop off's very handy for a 10 gigabytes or something, but when you. But you could put terabytes in the commercial plan. Yeah. And that's but, cheap. But, it, but, it, but, it's, but he's still got to get the funding for that. <laughs> no, uh, you have to be sure of that, things like that. But, well, I think some of the vendors do claim to have. But it, but it's still, but it still seems a clumsy way of going. There should be some infrastructure for sharing between academic institutions, that sort of. So, so I, th I, th I think a big, a big thing with that is is it's not where the storage is, whether the storage is at your own site or yep. at Diamond or in the commercial cloud, it's what the actual interface is that the user yeah, yeah, actually uses the software, the software that layer. That you need in, yeah, it's definitely. Connect. There you go. So we have an example of a case we're working on at the moment between a large university in London and a research site in Singapore, which is genomics data. Where they want to share 200 terabytes between the sites. Uh, we've done a lot of work in ensuring the network path can support good transfer. So we're seeing single stream per sonar throughput tests of 2.5 gigabits a second. So we know Globus could, yeah. I think the link is 10 gig, we could fill that 10 gig link with that data. And then it's, yeah, it's a question about which tools you're using to do that synchronization. Globus can do it, our sync could do it. Their need is 200 terabytes where they're getting the samples over the course of a two year project. So it's not a big bang, it's drip, drip, drip. So our sync would probably work fine. But there's more to it than just the transfer. There's 
you know, the security of it, it's the fact that it's personally identifiable data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not my area of expertise, but we certainly have people on this campus that, that have that. David, did you? Want, oh, yeah. There is the research data facility co-located with Archer. It is. It may not quite match what's on, but it is a research council-funded bunker for data. But perhaps what I mean today is reinforced is that the network isn't the impediment for doing this. And that was kind of the hypothesis that when we started this experiment we had. Is the network an impediment? Is what we have and how we can go from end to end from the machine and then the last mile to there, is that the impediment? And I think what we've shown kind of in spades is the network isn't the impediment. It might be some software, it might be where you put the data, but actually that was where we started out with this thought experiment. And that's, yeah, go on then, David, yeah, where we've ended up. He said very trying very, to wrap very, up to get no, no, drinks. Very brief remark. There's, there's, a threshold, there's a threshold issue there. If you're not, if you haven't done the work, it's hard. But if you can get over that threshold and establish a way of doing it and supporting this kind of stuff, then you're really in the game. Yeah, no. And I think just one thing to add, I think one, one thing I've always come across, whether it's when I used to work in Oxford or now at Diamond, is, is the path of least resistance for a user knowing who to speak to. So if they've come to Diamond and they've got a contact, a local contact or someone easy to speak to, it's easy to send them an email. And if they then do some magic behind the scenes and make it easy for them to do something, that's how they then get something done. If they're in a university, I used to come across a lot of people in Oxford in this situation who didn't actually know who to email or to speak to. They just then ended up doing something through the back door somewhere because they didn't yeah. know how to get the central IT guys to help out and actually facilitate it. You know. no. Well, in which case, I think that's probably a good, you know, bringing together those groupings. He says, trying to wrap up again. <laughs> I think he said, and on that note, um, bringing together those groupings is kind of what we've been able to show. And just to wrap up, just um, a, a few thanks. Some people put a real lot of effort into this. I mean, Tim's actually been really good, actually, on a lot of the organization and other part, but particularly also Sigourney and Timothy and, and Franz. So I, I think we should join in thanking them. And I think I'd also like to thank all of the speakers today who've been involved in the experiment, who've also brought in other bits of expertise and demos um, as part of it. So, you know, we wanted to show off a sort of end-to-end -end story, have it positioned in a variety of ways. And I know people are getting a lot of time to come and, come and do that. I think we've kind of done that in spades. So thanks very much to all of the speakers. And then just finally, I very much appreciate you. I mean, we've had a sort of quality interaction. We've got quite a very disparate set of people in the audience from all sorts of different places. And I hope that from what we've shown today, it will seed some things that will then go on and grow and expand from this point on. So from my perspective, my personal thanks to all of you for taking the time to come along to the event today. So now we can have some drinks. <laughs> Sorry, can I just say one thing? Um, we are going to upload the presentations on the SES website with permission of course uh, and on there we'll have a gallery and do a wrap up of the event so that will be in a couple weeks time and we'll send an email out and thanks to Simon